Sergeant, I've gone ahead and started the live stream, so. Computer recording started. Backup is rolling. Floor recording started. Thank you. Sergeant, help with the opening, please. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council Remote Hearing on Public Safety. For verification purposes with all panelists, please turn on your videos. I repeat, all panelists, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. Thank you. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your kind cooperation. Chair Adams, we are ready to begin. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today. And thank you for hanging in with us as we were experiencing some technical difficulties uh, by some of our panelists this morning. I am Council Member Adrian Adams, and I am the chair of the Committee on Public Safety. I would also like to acknowledge that we've been joined by my colleagues, uh, Council Members Powers, Holden, Brannon, Miller, Rosenthal, Riley and Cabrera. I believe we had the public advocate as well. Public advocate Jamani Williams is with us as well. Today, we will discuss the very important topic of how the council and the administration should assess the scope of responsibilities currently asked of the NYPD in order to collaboratively reimagine how to best promote public safety for all New Yorkers. Following the 2020 death of George Floyd, one of the many tragic incidents of unarmed black men being killed by police responding to relatively low level misconduct, unprecedented civil unrest emerged in cities and states across America, calling for a systemic reform of police departments nationwide and a shift in how localities approach achieving public safety. Seeking significant shifts in both criminal justice and broader social policies. Activists argue that prior attempts at police reform, such as increased training and other oversight measures had proven unsuccessful at preventing ongoing incidents of public abuse and brutality. Advocates instead focused protest demands on the need to reduce police budgets, decrease unnecessary police civilian encounters and reinvest funds into non-police health and safety solutions. Recognizing the historic significance of these unprecedented protests, the council embraced efforts to right-size the NYPD and reverse harmful cuts to social services as proposed by the administration to meet budget shortfalls caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Following weeks of difficult negotiation, the council and administration agreed on a budget for fiscal year 2021 that aimed to responsibly shrink the NYPD's budget and provide measures that begin to recognize a shift in how the city approaches policing. These efforts included an agreement for almost $1 billion in proposed budget reductions for the NYPD, including $484 million in cuts, $354 million in shifts to other agencies that could better carry out the respective roles, and $162 million in shifts of associated fringe costs, such as healthcare and pension costs. Significant sources of agreed upon cuts and savings were as follows. Permanently reduce the department's uniformed headcount by 1,171 officers. Removing NYPD from homeless outreach. Reducing NYPD overtime spending by $352 million. Removing school crossing guards from NYPD. Returning control of school safety to the Department of Education. Since the adoption of the fiscal 2021 budget, the administration has implemented some of the agreed upon reductions, while other aspects of the proposed fiscal plan have remained unfulfilled. At today's hearing, 
The committee is eager to hear from the administration regarding ongoing efforts to reevaluate the scope of responsibilities currently entrusted to the NYPD. The committee seeks an update from the administration on implementation of agreed upon reforms included as part of the 2020 budget agreement and the 2021 police reform and reinvention collaborative plan. The committee is interested in learning more about the administration's efforts to expand health-based crisis response programs, such as cure violence and the crisis management system to empower community-driven solutions to safely address societal issues that historically have been handled by police. And finally, the committee seeks to examine areas of enforcement or outreach currently within the NYPD's purview that could safely be entrusted to other agencies or community-based solutions. Ultimately, recognizing a need for meaningful reforms of policing while remaining committed to ensuring a police force equipped to protect all New Yorkers. I hope this conversation can bring all parties closer to an understanding of a productive path forward. A path forward that acknowledges the steps of the past, the realities of the present, and a vision for a better future. To achieve that vision, we must challenge ourselves to find common ground with those from different backgrounds or ideological beliefs and work collectively to understand where different viewpoints arise and strive to achieve policies that serve us all. With that, I call on public advocate Jamani Williams for his statement. Peace and blessings, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jemani Williams. I'm the public advocate of the city of New York. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Adams, uh, for not only leading this hearing, but for continuing to create the space for these kind of discussions to happen. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. I don't want to, uh, I cannot overstate the importance of this conversation the importance of always having this conversation as a focal point of any discussion around policing and public safety. As was mentioned last year, we saw um, people putting their voices in the streets and the conversation I think often got too myopic. Uh, there is no conversation uh, that is gonna be meaningful about money and changing the money. Any kind of reforms uh, which are needed but by themselves will never get to where we wanna get unless we have a conversation about what public safety is and how we achieve public safety as law enforcement with a partner, but not the only partner. And too often NYPD is e equalized as public safety when that's not true. And so I wanna begin with uh, what I always say uh, and sometimes gets left out. Uh, many of us who have this conversation, myself included, understand the critical role that NYPD plays by promoting, providing acute law enforcement solutions to criminal situations. Just this morning, uh, we saw our police intervene in a mass shooting uh, that prevented perhaps other people from getting shot. But what we want to do is make sure that the shootings don't occur in the first place. So we know that policing by itself cannot address all the components that make up personal and community well-being. For too long, our city has simply equated public safety with police and not just the city, but our state and our country. Whenever we are confronted with a problem of any sort, particularly if we're having trouble trying to figure out how to solve it, our solutions are very often to throw police at us. It's unfair to the community. It's actually unfair to the police officers who aren't equipped to solve every problem. We see this dynamic play out even in our budget, which Annie allocates, allocates almost $11 billion to the NYPD when, included, when including central allocated costs, despite other essential services consistently falling victim to austerity cuts. This excessive emphasis on policing has consequences. Societal, is societal issues often worsen as their root causes are going nowhere. Communities of more color are often subjected to hyper surveillance that increases the likelihood of discriminatory policing, privacy violations, and overuses of force. And more people are funneled into the carceral system, which in turn creates problems like the current humanitarian crisis on Rikers Island. I'm grateful that this committee has convened to reduce and to, to convene to discuss the reduction of responsibilities of the NYPD with the aim of advancing this conversation 
I'd like to identify areas in which targeted and community oriented approaches should be strengthened, while again, understanding that our law enforcement have important roles to play. The Mayor's Office of Gun Violence Prevention, which includes, uh, but is not solely uh, only the crisis management system, is one of the city's most useful resources in preventing shootings before they happen. However, the impact is currently limited by fiscal constraints. The upcoming city budget should dramatically increase the Mayor's Office of Gun Violence Prevention, uh, including uh, the programs that are there, including CMS, as it's commonly called, so that we can establish programs and new sites, expanding existing catchment areas, hiring more staff, minimize employee turnover, overlay new programs like the advanced peace model that is going to be overlaid. We have also seen the importance, uh, the role of uh, programs like uh, youth, uh, some of youth jobs play uh, as a whole and when targeted uh, with these programs uh, in place that identify the people who most need it. The schools, the NYPD currently assigns over 5,000 school safety agents, almost 200 uniformed NYPD officers to New York City schools who are empowered to detain, arrest, issue court summonses to students who are often the first point of contact when there's an issue. These punitive approaches to discipline children, predominantly those of more color, uh, even when you look at the same behaviors in other in, uh, students that are not of more color, has created an atmosphere of fear for many students in school hallways that is not conducive to learning and creates a pipeline to the criminal justice system. Uh, we have to work on a structure that begins to replace the over-reliance of a police presence and an infrastructure with a healing center of restorative justice frameworks. We will keep students physically safe by supporting them to build positive relationships and resolve conflict and address many of the social and emotional stressors that result in students acting out. The next budget should very much consider uh, and must continue to increase the number of school counselors, social workers, and psychologists. And I don't want my words to be misconstrued. Uh, we cannot allow uh, 5,000 uh, school safety agents, including uh, mostly women, women of more color, uh, to be fired in this process. Homelessness and housing, being homeless is not a crime, yet instead of providing targeted support that addresses the root of the problem, the city and state have increased the role of NYPD and the MTA in its strategies to address homelessness in recent years. This expansion of police into the social service sector is outside of this agency's mission to enforce the law. Law enforcement agents should be removed from providing primary homeless services. This includes ending punitive sweeps and the harmful subway diversion program. Moving forward, our focus must be on providing permanent housing solutions and supportive services. Mental health, each year 911 receives nearly 200,000 emergency calls involving individuals with in mental health crisis. The city must do more to prevent this crisis from occurring by strengthening local community-based mental health infrastructure, especially in communities of more color and building out infrastructure to begin with. For when crisis occurs, we must implement a true citywide non-police response in order to improve services and minimize hospitalization and justice involvement. The current Be Heard program is severely insufficient in achieving the goal and should be overhauled in favor of a system that includes a dedicated 988 hotline center social workers, mental health peers, and EMS as first responders, minimizes NYPD's initial involvement. In this aim, I encourage the council to pass our officer's bill into 2222 and to continue making progress on intro 2210, announcement by Alice bill, including addressing issues in bill language raising and raised in the committee on mental health hearing in April of this year. During transportation, the tragic continuation of traffic violence death demonstrates that the police centered approach to street safety is not working how we want it. The city should build on the passage of intro 2224, House Member Rodriguez, by fully transferring tra uh, traffic enforcement responsibilities from NYPD to DOT, which held these responsible until Major Line shifted them to NYPD in 1996. We must be mindful of those workers, their pay, and how they feel uh, when doing the job and think about their safety as well while we do this. Our office also supports ending the city's punitive approach to public trans transit fare evasion. This approach does not make public transportation safer, but simply criminalizes the predominant low income New Yorkers of more color. It also uh, keeps the resources of police that we have in the wrong spaces. Instead of walking around the train, trains platform, the train stations, they are focused on people hopping the train. The city should instead double spending on fair fare so that it covers 100% of fair costs for the lowest income New Yorkers. This will significantly minimize fare invasion, reduce policing costs, and deliver positive economic impact. But also prevent the incessant calls for more police in the train station when we haven't really assessed where the police are right now. 
sex work. Lastly, the city must move towards a public health centered approach to sex work. Our office supports ending the NYPD advice unit, which lacks both accountability and even more importantly, effectiveness and continue to decriminalize sex work. The district attorney should begin to consider refusing many of the cases that come before it. Our office additionally calls for the city to fund the resource, resources that uh, sex workers need to engage in their work safely, including access to rapid STD testing and individual centered economic and employment services. Also, the NYPD's use of technology must be fully transparent, non-discriminatory, non respectful of privacy rights and limited to necessary use. The recent release of reports related to the POST Act demonstrate that the NYPD has amassed a military grade arsenal of surveillance technology that fails to meet these criteria. New York City should mimic cities like Seattle and Oakland by requiring the city council to approve police technology purchases. Our office has engaged the Racial Justice Commission to allow the public to vote on these measures as a pallet question. NYPD must also cease all collaborations with ICE. It is greatly concerned that NYPD has confirmed that ICE agents provided security for police precincts during protests following the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. The collaboration occurred in violation of New York City's own sanctuary city status without any transparency to the, transparency to the public or city council. The NYPD also supported ICE and deportation operations, including the attempted deportation of Robbie Ragbear, which I was involved in. Uh, this action must be investigated fully by the Office of Inspector General, and the responsibility must be held. The response of those responsible must be held accountable. Additional oversight measures must be put in place to ensure that NYPD does not repeat these collaborations of this sort again. Thank you so much uh, for your consideration, for your time, and more importantly, for this very important conversation with everyone at the table trying to figure out how we can best provide public safety for all New Yorkers in a way that's respectful to all New Yorkers. And I'll just add that in many of these services that we plan out, even police officers themselves, when you speak to them, don't want to be responding to all of them because they also uh, know that they don't have uh, the means to fix all of them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Public Advocate Williams, for your statement today. With that, I will now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Counsel, Josh Kinsley, who will provide some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Adams. Um, I'm Josh Kingsley, Counsel to the Public Safety Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen to your name to be called. I will be periodically answering who is the next panelist. The first panelist to give testimony will be representatives from the New York City Police Department and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Testifying for the NYPD will be Danielle Pemberton, Deputy Commissioner of Strategic Initiatives, Deputy Commissioner Christine Ryan, Inspector Stephen Hellman, Francis Giordano, Deputy Chief of Crime Strategies, Crime Control Strategies, Lola Obi, Deputy Chief of School Safety Division, Oleg Chernovsky, Assistant Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters, Michael Clark, the Director of Legislative Affairs. Additionally, we'll have Executive Director Marco Soler from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice available as well. I will call on each of you when it's your turn to speak. Uh, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask any questions of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. I will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Uh, members of the administration, I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Um, and can we be sure that they are unmuted as well on our end? Um, do you firm to tell the truth? <laughs> The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees, and to respond honestly to council member questions. Uh, we will begin with Deputy Commissioner Pemberton. I do. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Ryan. I do. Great. Inspector Hellman. I do. Deputy Commissioner I do. Giordano. I do. Deputy Commissioner Obi. I do. I do. Mr. Chernovsky. I do. Mr. Clark. I do. And Mr. Soler. I do as well. Okay, great. Thank you. You may you may begin, everyone. Good morning, Chair Adams and members of the council. Apologies for some of the technical difficulties we had earlier. I'm Danielle Pemberton, Deputy Commissioner of Strategic Initiatives for the New York City Police Department. I'm joined today by the police, police Commissioner Shea, a late addition, 
Chief, Chief Tobin, Deputy Commis Commissioner Ryan, Assistant Deputy Commissioner Oleg Tarnovsky, Deputy Chief Chief Francis Giordano, Deputy Chief Olufan Milola Obe, Obe Inspector Stector Stephen, in, in, Director Michael Clark, as my colleague, colleagues from the Office of Criminal Justice. On behalf of the Police Commissioner Dermot Che, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss the roles and responsibilities of the New York City Police Department. The city and the nation are currently grappling with the proper role of law enforcement in modern, modern society. In any discussions around this issue, public safety must be paramount. The core of the NYPD's mission is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of all those who live in, work in, or visit our city. This is the guiding principle behind the department's work. To protect and to serve are words, words associated with law enforcement. And these words apply to the men and the women of the NYPD. Our dedicated professionals, police, our policers, to our school safety agents, from our traffic enforcement agents to our one operators, and all manner of civilian and uniformed personnel in between, body these words to the fullest. The NYPD has always been prepared to take on any task to ensure the safety and improve the quality of life of the people of this city. This department will continue to answer the call of those who need us, whether it be working with communities to help paint over graffiti, to find funding and, and using our resources to construct recreational areas and communities that need it most, dedicating staff to ensure safety in our city's homeless shelters when this council has asked us to do so, addressing street homelessness and both legal, legal, legal vending issues in response to concerns raised by members of the, of the community. Currently, currently science serves to assist the Department of Correction in providing a safe environment for CSEs, to name a few. While the NYPD PD stands to assist whenever and wherever needed, we do recognize that there are areas of public service that have historically evolved in a way that has resulted in the NYPD taking the lead response for many, for many comp social, emotional, and behavioral situations in our society, such could be served by other public or private entities. For instance, while it may have made, made sense the NYPD and FDNY to be the sole responders to first occur crisis, numbers were much lower than today, it is clear that a new approach is warranted. warranted. That the department supports the Be Heard pilot, which launched in Central and East Harlem in June 2020, and deploys it as a team of DNY EMTs and social workers to 911 call and calls for, for, for mental health crisis not involving criminal activity, weapons, or risk of risk of violence. The sense of deployment employment of city forces and the PD will continue to work with EMS to help persons in crisis when the situation warrants it. Likewise, likewise, it's on a reimagine of the NYPD's PD's role providing school safety by the council and administration in last year's budget. The NYPD has been fully engaged in the transition planning and discussions this past year and is committed to a successful transition of responsibility. We are continuing to work towards completing the transition position by 1st, 2022. School safety agents are not, are not only of the NYPD family, they are part of each school's community and have come to know the, ch the children they want to protect on a first name basis and serve as role models. We are confident they will continue their, their excellent when they are with the Department of Education. As part of the, of the police reform and reinvention collaborative, the city council passed legislation shifting the responsibility to issue press passes to the mayor's office of media and entertainment. We have been working with the mayor's office to ensure a seamless transition, and we expect the transition to be complete by January. Additionally, as the budget negotiations in 2020, the NYPD agreed to, read to limit homeless outreach units. Unit. The Department of Homeless Services expanded the scope of its work, with the NYPD taking on a more supportive role, unless a public safety concern arises during one of those encounters. Additionally, additionally, infinite street vending laws moved to the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection under the Office of Street Vendor Enforcement. 
while the Office of Street Vendor Enforcement now has primary responsibility for ending vendor violations the city sidewalks and streets. The NYPD will continue to assist when, al when alternative interventions have failed to address these issues. In areas that are core police functions, we recognize that our work is greatly enhanced with the support of the community and our partner agencies. In the past two years, we have seen troubling increases in gun, vi gun violence, and we have utilized preci precision police to significantly increase the number of gun seizures and arrests. But this is not, en it's not enough. Critical to reducing gun violence, violence is our partnership with violence prevents provider. Provider providers mean before a person fires a gun, saving lives and preventing individuals from making choices that result in a, in a life in the criminal system. My colleagues from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice are available to answer any questions you may have on these, on these violence interventions. The support of other agencies and community groups is critical crit solving many problems in our neighborhoods. The department's innovative community solutions program seeks to address issues on a micro level, working with the local precinct, the residents, other agencies, and on community advocates to solve problems unique to each community. Everything from, everything from chronicness and, graf and graffiti, gun violence and noise congestion conditions have been addressed through these community partnerships. This program does not mean the NYPD is leaving these issues to be solved by, other, by others. Rather, it increases partnership accomplish accomplish their goal of a safe, safe and able city. Thank you for this opportunity to be here and we look forward, look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, we are going to turn to chair questions. Um, before we do so, I'm going to administer the oath to Commissioner Shea, who I believe joined us um, just just now. Um, if that's all right. Uh, do you do you firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before your the, these committees, and to answer honestly to council member questions? Yeah, you have to believe. That. I already I already said, but I'll say I'll say yeah. And yes, I glad to be here. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, yep. Chair Adams, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome again to all of you. Thank you for being here this morning, and we apologize for the delay. All right, let's let's talk about uh, uh, over. Let's talk about overtime first. In the fiscal year 2020, NYPD added 130 million dollars for overtime expenses that went over the budget. This year as well, NYPD again went over the overtime budget by 168 million dollars and needed to add the money after the year was over. Given these amounts, and that the overtime cut for this fiscal year is $175 million, what assurance do we have that at the end of the year, more money won't have to be added because the department did its budgeted overtime once again? So the, the uh, significant overtime budget cuts in fiscal year 21, we did end up at the end of the day spending 26% less, less than the original budget. But uh, the key drivers of the spend over the significantly reduced budget were crime reduction uh, initiatives related to addressing the increase in violent crime, crime and some details, including enhanced transit platform coverage and election coverage, the protests and civil unrest, and investigations. In fiscal year 22, the city funded budget is actually lower than what we spent last year. Uh, we don't have the benefit of some of the uh, events that uh, have resulted from the pandemic, can't, the reduction in events related to the pandemic. It's still really early in the year with regard to uh, projections and we're going to continue to focus, focus on our resources, modifying work schedules, and that oversight will continue while we address the resource needs for strategic crime reduction deployments, investigations, interrupted provision of our services, and the ability to address unfor unforeseen. But we do take uh, monitoring and, and uh, attaining our budget very seriously, but we have to balance that with public safety. Are, are you limiting the amount of overtime that sometimes you make? Sorry, uh, you cut out at that last part of your question. Okay, I, I ask, are you, are you actually limiting the amount of overtime that some employees can, can take? 
we're, we're focused on monitoring all of the overtime time and focus on going when and where we can can so that we can we can minimize the use of the overtime to the extent the extent. So right now you're you're just you're saying that you're modifying, but you haven't you haven't actually taken any to limit anything to limit the overtime. Yes, yes, we're limiting the overtime by looking at schedules by by looking how we how we deploy our resource. So yes, we are very much limiting the overtime. Okay, so um, along those lines, has the department considered reallocating civilian positions so that uniform offices, officers on duty um, can return to performing duties of uniform officers? Civilian civilian is something that we have looked at historically and are our continue to look at. We, we do, of course, uh, deal with the fact that we are down right now yeah. more than a thousand thousand full time civilian personnel for the last sixteen months. As, re as a result, the uh, cuts and attrition that we've seen across the department. So is limiting overtime spending considered by the department when making decisions related to officer department or enforcement priorities? Yeah. All right. If I may. Yeah. yeah. Chair Adams, I, just, just to end on what Christine said, I mean, we, we constantly, to civilianize and put uniform people on the on the street. I, I think yeah. by my record of we've moved more officers out in, in recent years, any time in my memory. But but as Christine, we're dealing with uh, roughly right now uh, a doubling of the the shootings in New York City over the last two years. At the same time that we're de we're dealing with count, re count reduction put into place last last year. As of this morning, we stand about twelve hundred. Uh, uh, office down from the new head count. I think it would be about uh, 2,200 down if my math is right on the head count. And, and, and civilian side, we, we would love to put, put uh, free, up, free up units on space. Civilian attrition running actually, uh, almost as bad as the, the uniform that's hampering us in many ways. I think the, the current count as of, as of this that I have is 34,000 range on the uniform side, 17,000 on the green side, side for a heck, heck of just over 52,000. Okay, so, no. so uh, I'm sorry. Can sorry. I to cut you off? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, so I apologize. So uh, along those lines, with uh, shifting positions, let's take a look at the 2020 budget. The 2020 budget, there was an agreement to shift school shift guards from NYPD to DOE, and it, it, it wasn't reflected in any upcoming budgets. This is projected to shift over $42 million out of the NYPD budget. So what is the status of this change and when will the budget reflect these shifts? Realize that and that's the 42 million you reference, reference uh, for school safety that is reflected in the budget for fiscal year, fiscal year three. Uh, that funding of $305 million has, has been from NYP effective July 1st, 2022. It looks like we may have lost Chair Adams. If you bear with us for just a second. Oh, no, she's yeah, still I apologize. My connection is unstable this morning. So we're, we're all having, you know, whatever the internet gremlins are, are at, at in full force today. So I'm going to repeat my question. I'm not sure whether or not you heard it. So I'm going to repeat my question. It had to do with, um, it had to do with uh, school safety. All right. Um, we uh, we wanted to know what where we're going along with uh, school safe, school uh, safety. 
Um, it's been recognized to occur in the budget by fiscal year 2023. The agreement further included commitments by the administration to engage stakeholders in developing transition plans and reoriented school safety activities to include restorative justice practices. What's the status of planning for the shift of school safety? Okay, I can answer that. Good morning, uh, Good morning. Good morning. Um, so the transition to the DOE is still on track uh, with a transfer date of July, 2022. Starting in August of this year, uh, the mayor's office of operations was tasked with the project management portion of the transition. Okay, how, how is this transition being received? Uh, by certain stakeholders? Right, by the schools, um, by, the, uh, by the SSAs themselves. How is it being received in your estimation? Um, I think it just, it depends on what lens you're looking through and what bucket you fall in. Uh, I think there is, you know, overall some apprehension on the, uh, on the side of the SSAs. Uh, but in terms of community engagement portion, I think that I'll defer that question to the um, mayor's office uh, of operations. Can anyone answer that? Have the school, uh, I'll, I'll ask you something else. Have the school safety officers received any additional training or has the department changed any in-school procedures for the upcoming school year? Um, the initial training they received was early on this year. Um, and I think we, refer, we talked about that uh, over um, um, at least two council uh, hearings. The DOE did provide training to the, uh, the agents, but early on this year. So, um, there is nothing new, like I mentioned, um, and I'll defer to the mayor's office of operations for any, because they've been brought on as project managers. So um, that's, that's the latest so far now. Okay. There are plans to increase NYPD staffing of mental health co-response teams. However, uh, early data indicates that the behavioral health emergency response division or be heard, which was mentioned in, in uh, in, uh, in, in Danielle's opening statement, the initiative be heard where mental health practitioners and paramedics are dispatched to certain acute mental health emergencies, rather um, police results in improved patient results. Um, how will these new officers and response teams be utilized? Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Thank you for unmuting me. Mm -hmm. The um, Be Heard teams are made up of, they're comprised of two EMTs, He's one health and hospital clinician who go, who go out and respond to 911 nonviolent with no weapons involved calls for people in mental health crisis. It is run by the FDNY uh, EMS section. How is the department assessing the success thus far? So we participate in uh, weekly meetings with the Be Heard um, folks at both uh, health and hospitals, uh, the mayor's office of, of community mental health, and with the FDNY EMS. EMS. We review the calls that have been responded to, as well as um, uh, evaluate what has been done to make sure that people are connected to services. Does the, um, the an expanding be heard citywide? Hey, Terry, can I take yes, that? Yes, the FDNY is expanding, but the date and, sure. Oh. Yeah, Chair Adams, I think I'm on record um, for quite some time, time now saying that I, su I support 
taking the NYPD wherever possible away from these walls where there's no weapon and no history of violence. I think, uh, I think the whole country is seeing this phenomenon. I, I just urge everyone to go slowly and carefully fully in terms of measure, measuring this test and measure, measuring um, what the follow through is. through is. What I mean specifically to that is when, when the NYU, I think it's roughly, Terry, 25% of the time that the team is, team is working they are responding and we are not, we are not really uh, a, a, there is going to be a need down the road, I believe, for a, a full study, study of the term, term and what the real effects are. So six months out, three months out, a year out, year out happens to the, to the people, what, what type of service do they receive? Um, I, I think, you know, I, I still stand behind my original assessment of, I think there is clearly seems that the PD does not need to respond on here. This is, um, while it is uh, scheduled for expansion, I think everyone should go into it eyes wide open. Okay, that, that was my next that question. Just answered it, answered it uh, Commissioner. But I was going to ask what the justification is for increasing um, uh, the number of, um, of police um, when the data shows that a health-centered approach without police involvement is more effective. So I think you just answered that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure maybe Terry, Terry, clear it up for me. I meet and talk to Terry on Terry on this line. When, when you said that the, the um, this is my words, not yours, that it's like a better result. I'm not sure how that is, that is being calculated. Terry, do you, do you, can you, can you expand? So the um, mayor's office of community health examines whether the patients that were connected to care remain in care uh, once the Be Heard team has connected with them. Okay. So let me let me back up a little bit, Commissioner. You you mentioned no no weapon uh, or history of violence, but what defines history of violence? Police responding instead of be heard. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn to Terry in a moment. So I think the weapon piece is the 9-11 the operators. I, I stopped at the 9-11 uh, the call center out in Queens just to thank them a, them a couple ago. And there's a, I, I actually actually met some of them and spoke to some of the 9-11 operators. They do a great job. Great job. And they're special, especially to, to ask certain quest questions when walls come in. Um, in terms of um, the specifics, uh, I'll let Terry speak to that. But it's what we know we know about the location from prod, prod call calls to, and then obviously on the weapon side side I think it's, it's fine to talk. Terry, sure. The nine one one call operators determine if the call is for an emotionally disturbed person, and then it is handed over to the FDNY communication folks who determine whether it is Be Heard eligible. And they are the people that determine whether the Be Heard team will respond oh, to that um, specific call. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, I'm gonna ask you about um, your youth coordination officers. The NYPD will be funding 300 youth coordination officers. It's gonna cost taxpayers upwards of $35 million. What role will the youth coordination officers serve? Who's, who's got that in a mate? Or I would love to. Yeah, yeah. Her. I threw everything off by showing up. I'm sorry. So we, we're going off script here. But when you look at, uh, James, when you look at from day one, when I was sworn in, I spoke, spoke about um, um, 20, 28 years in the police department and and. and and what I've seen over time and talk, talk about investment in youth as being paramount, paramount uh, to what I think, what I think needs done. Uh, I think you saw that last, last year when there were cuts to the summer youth, youth programs. This is right before or during George Floyd. It might have been even before. Um, and I stepped up and stepped up and took the money from the PD's budget to really to for that. I felt that strongly about it. We have put into place youth officers, youth coordination officers across the city in all of our PSA incidents. Getting, getting 
uh, incredible feedback from across New York City and every precinct on the work of work of doing, doing Connect Youth. Um, I would liken it to the earlier discussion when I walked in, I heard about the discussion about from uh, Jamani Williams speaking about fund funding management. Uh, everyone want, wants for different programs. I would fight wholeheartedly on, on program, program kids of this city. I think it is crime fighting. I think it's keeping kids out of that cycle of uh, getting involved negatively in the criminal justice system. And from sports to the arts, to the partnerships that we've done with, with the private sector and trying to get kids internships and jobs, uh, I think we've, we've done a whole lot. And it's something that I feel should, should be only kept. It should be, it should be ended. Um, not, not the police department's view, but really for the whole, the whole city's view. So, so that's my short answer. I could certainly a answer specific questions. Uh, you, you, you mentioned in crisis, crisis management system, and that's something that is, you know, yes. which we're really happy about. Yeah. Um, are, the, um, are the crisis management uh, groups invited to NYPD ComStat strategizing meetings? Thanks. So we've, we've, we currently have, um, we've invited them to one police, one police and we've invited them to the actual room and had a, a strategy session with them in the past. Things that frankly have never been done before in the history of, of sites. Um, and, and we currently partake in meetings and sharing of information on a weekly basis. And that's done in conjunction with uh, uh, Mock J. That's done in conjunction with the highest levels of the of the NYD, up to and including, you know, Chief uh, Harrison, the Chief of Department, as well as Chief Chief Michael B. Three. There's the Comstat Stat Me. So um, it's it's done done under the radar. Uh, we no one knows knows better than my my times. Um, um, what we're seeing across the city and how do we prevent prevent before it happens whether it's calls or shots fired jobs or gangs that are involved. And we share, share that on a weekly basis with uh, um, representatives from Mache as well as uh, um, the crisis managers. I just noticed that Frank Giordano chief is here and he can expand on that. Good morning. So, so um, your violence part, partners are part, part of uh, suppressing gun violence throughout the city. Um, uh, Cure violence court coordinators are in the community communities that are, and they have to have the opportunity, opportunity to share their experience uh, to prevent shooting violence across the city. Um, they also have, also have the capability to convince people, especially young people, not to engage in violence before any incidents even start. Uh, work collaboratively with the mayor's office of criminal justice. Uh, to ensure that citywide resources are uh, deployed to ensure uh, maximum effectiveness. So each week, on days of every week, week uh, the late afternoon, we have a meeting with Mayor's Office of, of Criminal Staff related, related to your violence deployment around the city. And we that that Thursday after the afternoon because the because violence tends to increase a bit bit approach the uh, the weekends especially in the warmer, warmer month. Um, we discuss specifics related to some of the violence across the city, um, make recommendations as to where pure, pure violence in L should be deployed, whether it be Mott Haven up in the Bronx or the far Rockaways or uh, Brownsville in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, to give specific, specific information related to some of the conflicts occurring. So the communication is uh, very clear, clear, clear with the uh, mayor's office of criminal justice related to our uh, deployment from our staff. What are some of the biggest challenges yeah. facing uh, the NYPD as it pertains to or with collaboratively, collaboratively with um, the violence interrupters? What I've noticed is that uh, all of the groups, all of the groups, oh, they're very strong. They're out there. Yeah. There doesn't really seem to be um, uh, uniformity among the precincts and the usage and how they're using the cure violence um, teams. 
um, I, I guess uh, every, every precinct has its own personality and its own culture. Perhaps maybe that's the reason, but what are your thoughts about that? Is there a way to, 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 to provide a more uniform structure when it comes to the precincts and the, and the um, violence interrupters under the crisis, uh, the cure violence system? So as far as outcomes go related to um, deployment, I, I think it's too soon to tell, um, you know, related to what type of outcome, outcomes there are. I think there is really good communication from us, um, you know, at this level and also at the command level, command, command is in, within certain command, command have instantaneous commission in some service providers that, that, that are operating within their, within their, within their jurisdiction. Um, but we, we do receive good feedback from uh, the weekly calls that we have, you know, cure violence, violence uh, coordinators in the mayor's you know, give us information related to some of the information that they're receive, receiving from the community, meaning the community will ask for, you know, specific police deployment in certain areas related to some of the violence that are occurring or, or they'll ask us for certain equipment like light towers, towers on a call specific corner to light up the public space. You know, you know, that communication, that communication is there and, it, and it's product, productive. That's good. I, I know there's, there's been a lot of great progress okay. around this. I'm also interested to hear about um, the, the um, program, the, uh, the Brownsville Safety Alliance. Can you describe that and and uh, perhaps tell us whether it's going to be an expansion of that program? Sure. The uh, Brownsville Safety Alliance was a a, a a pilot program, a program that was sending sending and it's really it's not it's not a thing necessarily. It's part of our community solutions program uh, that was instituted uh, by the NYPD under the commissioner and uh, Chief Holmes. Uh, it had it has been ended. Um, it is there have a hundred programs in in over fifty six, um, and the idea is to get community residents, local stakeholders together to work on issues that are unique to each community. Um, and it is uh, you know I just want to be clear be clear in the seventy third precinct that the NYPD pulled out out of the area. It was a collaboration with the NYPD and the other NGOs, community agencies, community residents on the ground, trans providers. To perform more, more services to an area that needed that needed. That's the whole goal. Whole goal of the community program is in each precinct you can, you can work together to find the right av avenues for your needs. Needs. Um. So, so over 100 precinct precincts. Oh, over 100 programs and then over 50 precincts at this point. That's great. Uh, yeah, I was I was wondering um, where that was. That's great because we had gotten really good feedback on that. Um, can you um? Speak to some of the issues these interrupters face within the course of their work and their interface with either the public and or the NYPD. They have a uh, you know the violence interrupters have a have a uh, you know they're embedded you know within the communities that they that they serve and um you know they have that cert, cert, that certain ability level that they have to maintain. While they're while they're uh, you know you know work work out in the field, so the communication from the violence interrupters specific, specific you know goes through the mayor's office of criminal justice and comes to the police department through those weekly meeting meetings that we have. Okay, do do you do you see any? Um, I'll, I'll ask you one more, and I'll, I'm going to come back around probably for round two. I want to get my colleagues in here because I know we started late. It, have you noticed any tension um, with partnership between um, uh, the precincts and the violence interrupters, or or are you seeing everything going smoothly? Is our 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 crisis management um, uh, team uh, uh, members being you know welcomed as a part of the partnering process with NYPD, or have you noticed any friction? So just on some of the calls, um, you know, we brought up specific areas around the city, um, 
where you know specific cure violence staff was not deployed within and that developed into conversations into you know developing those areas to have you know you know the deployment deployment um you know so the communication was was you know remain remains I'm not sure if it's me whose audio is going out or yours. yours. Can you can you hear us, Chair Adams? I can hear you now. Yeah. I think uh, Chief Giordano just answered that question. I don't know if you heard any of it. Okay, he was he was going in and out, but that's all right. I'm gonna turn it over. Um, to my colleagues, uh, we have council members Yeager and Levin who have joined us. Yes. Turn it over to uh, to our community council at this time. Uh, thank you, everyone. Council members, please use the Zoom raise hand function if you'd like to ask a question. Okay, will we begin with Chair Holden? Uh, sir, you'll have five minute timer. Um, you could begin when you're unmuted. Thank you, Chair. Uh, do you hear me? Everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was me either. You know, my internet, uh, we, did, we did lose a little bit. And pardon um, if, I, if I asked questions that, were, that the Chair covered, but I was just coming from another hearing running at the same time, a parks hearing. Um, so, um, Commissioner, I just have a, a few questions. Um, I'm, I'm talking to the uh, commanding officers of my precincts in my district, and to the person, they're frustrated. They're frustrated that they're arresting the same people over and over again. For instance, we had one um, individual who's arrested six times for um, GLA. Um, uh, grand larceny auto and six times and he's out he's out the next day and he's, and he's did it, they're arresting him again and, and th this is a tremendous waste of resources that not only that the public is being victimized that the police officers have to do the same old thing over and over again and we're not learning our lesson um, like i predicted when all the people said, well, let's um, uh, unfund the police or defund the police, uh, $1 billion. I predicted, I predicted that the first uh, uh, officers that would be cut would be the uh, community officers, uh, the NCOs program. And Chief Holmes uh, acknowledged that in the last hearing. Um, my NCO program has been devastated in my district because of the defund the police um, and, and also for uh, the academy classes. Uh, I'm, um, I have a shortage in all of my precincts in my district. We need more cops, not less. And then for the people that are, are saying about school safety officers that should not be in our schools, they shouldn't be in, under NYPD. I failed to see any kind of uh, stats or numbers on this, how, how it would affect um, the quality, because oh. I had school safety officers, Commissioner, tell me, school safety officers on NYPD tell me that some of the principals in the schools or the staff were pressuring them not to report certain crime that happened in the school. Can you imagine if this is under the Department of Education, the problems that would arise? I just lost you at the end, Councilman. Okay, I don't know what, what you last heard, but... Um, I, well, I, I heard the last point. I just didn't know if you were done. Well, I, I said, yeah, I had... I, I had um, I'm had. i just concerned about the the whole taking the, the, the cops out, NYPD out of, out of our schools and getting to a situation where we don't, we don't have trained individuals or 
where they don't have accountability. If the school controls reporting crimes within the school, um, a lot of things could get covered up like they have been in the past. Um, but I just want you, if you could address the, the same people that are being arrested within the precincts and over and over again, the frustration that we're seeing on the ground from the COs. Well, I would add to that. I, I, I think frustration is on the, on the public as well. Um, and that's, that's my opinion, but that's what I, it's what I hear every single day, day in every single neighborhood from every single denomination across New York City. That, I, that I, there is a growing realization that you just need to be made to speak to some um, carefully, smartly. Um, that doesn't that doesn't doesn't go with fast in any one direction. But there's clearly clearly um, fixes that need to be made to some laws. We are literally literally lives on a on a daily basis. Um, sometimes you know very young young lives and. You know, just this week we saw a case of a teenager that is now now two rooms uh, that will be facing a murder charge for another young man that's been taken from us. And when you look at look at the, I, I honestly at this at this point I think that everyone on this call has heard me say me say it. Uh, there is there is there is no better way or more clear way for me to say what I have said many, many times. Unfortunately, the people of New York City and state is who is suffering at this point. Right, and, and just uh, in case I missed it, and I, again, I'm sorry, but on the violence interrupters, are there, can we measure their success or the lack thereof? Is, there, is it possible to measure it? Or do we have the numbers to, to, to say it's working? I would push that to the mayor's office, office of criminalists who administers the program. Uh, I would say, would say that councilman, in terms of policing and public public is really what we're, what we're talking here today. There's there's many many differences to it, and I am of the belief that we really reach out reach out maximum when we have have as many people as pos possible in that from that process from store owners. From elected official, officials, business business owners, people that people that live in on the community community, most state state clear clergy, and including violence officers. So people, the better. Um, in, in the process, I think that's what that's what you truly right. truly get to a good place in terms of metrics. I would push that to mock check. All right, just uh, one other, uh, chair, if I may, one other question. Um, it, did the elimination of two academy classes as part of the billion dollar cut impact overtime? Yes. I've... Did you hear me? Yes, the answer, the answer is yes. It did. And did it impact public safety in your opinion and the quality of life in New York City? Yes, it did. Bingo. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Josh, are there any other hands up? Are there any other council members who'd like to ask questions? Please use the Zoom raise hand function right now. Seeing none, I'll turn back to the, the chair. Uh, council members, if you have any questions and want to chime in, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, chair Adams, you can continue. Okay, I, I know that my colleagues uh, are between hearings, so that's probably why they're not uh, in right now. They're probably bouncing from one room to another. So I'm just going to continue then um, with a couple more questions. When it comes to um, assessing, um, where where and is effective um, in, in 2019, the NYPD unveiled a new community center in East New York that would be run by NYPD personnel. Yep. An initiative significantly expands the role and scope of the NYPD and communities of color. The center is primarily targeted to youth with educational, recreational, and social programming. How does the NYPD 
be operating in a community center, achieve improved public safety outcomes? And does the NYPD feel that they do, that you do a better job um, instead of uh, uh, bringing in a, uh, a CBO to run such a program? Thank you for that question, Chair Adams. Um, 127 Penn, is that what you're about? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think it's a choice, and, and I'm not sure, Danielle, who was, was slated to answer this, this one, never shy with an, with an opinion. I don't, I don't think it's a choice where it's one or the other. The other I think we complement each other. Uh, um, Jeff Madry, our Chief of Community, community Affairs, and, and the whole team there, I think, do a really, really good job. I've been there many times. Um, when you look at what we do in that facility, whether it's, you know, we have working with kids and writing maze and how to do it, to do it just for jobs. And we have them certainly doing the traditional sports and things of that nature. We have outside people from the community coming in and teaching them how to cook how to do karate and, and just too many different things to mention. Um, so it's not, it's not like the police, police can do it better than anyone else. We'd like to get to a point where it's, it's just, just the community space and we all do it together. And I, I, I'll, I'll go back to, you know, what we went through in 2000, 2020, but we never want to get back, get back to but, but, um, coming after the murder of George Floyd. And, and certainly it caused us and really, and really going across the country to look in the mirror, mirror on, on changes that, you know, we, you know, we are part and we still are, but changes that was that we had to and, con and continue. How, how is it that we, you know, you know fell at one place, but wound up in a very, very different place and, and, and lost trust so quickly and, and, and getting people to see the police as not somebody, somebody and a woman that wears a uniform, but see them as a, as a human being. So, so I've got community centers, centers doing other things. We could, we could do a lot of different programming there. And, and I don't know, again, it's you or somebody else, somebody else that's talk about what the, the future facility looks like. So as the commissioner, commissioner mentioned, we do do a lot of programming there where we bring in community-based or based organizations that, that run that programming. So it's, so it's not a us center. Or, uh, we, we have a lot of, of external organizations coming, coming in as well. We are also going through a process right now um, um, where we're re-envisioning DER with, in partnership with the community. So, so this is um, about a six-month engagement. Um, we're doing a lot of focus groups. We're we're having a lot of conversations about where the community communities is center, is center going to. Sure. Adams, did we do we lose your connection there? For a second, I got most of it and then I froze. But I, I, I did hear the response, so thank you. Um, I see my colleagues are back on screen. Perhaps uh, council members Levin and Rosenthal may have questions at this time. We're going to go to chair uh, council member Rosenthal, followed by council member Levin. Yes, go ahead, council member Rosenthal, once you're unmuted. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Boy, do I appreciate this hearing. So thank you, Chair Adams. Thank you, Commissioner Shea for coming on. Um, really appreciate it. And I really wanna thank everyone else I see who's logged on to this Zoom. I know um, you're gonna have some important things you'd like to talk about. Um, Commissioner, I, you were talking for a minute about the pilot project that occurred in Council Member Alika Sampri, um, Ampri Samuel's district. Could you, um, I, I think I misheard you. Could you talk again about um, the status of doing that program throughout the city? Um, is it me or can, or can you? Sorry. 
Can you hear thank me now, Councilwoman? Yes, yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. That was um, Mike, Mike that spoke about earlier. What I would just add, and he can jump in, is, uh, you know, Chief Juanita Holmes, great, great job she did with this, putting this together with her team out there in Brooklyn last year. Um, I think Mike said, and it's accurate, that what was reported in the news wasn't, wasn't true um, in that, like, the police were pulled out of this area. The police were a... a a big part of it. And, and really yeah. what Juanita was trying to do was pu push commanding officers to identify locations in New York City that have been resistant to traditional method, method it's by police or any other organizations, agencies, and things that came up were sanitation, parks, noise, certainly quality of life and police issues. So to identify these areas and, and work with the community and, and agents how to find, find long solutions. So I think that's ongoing. Going. Yeah, and right now uh, uh, we've started 100 unique programs in over 50 precincts. Um, they, it's again, all, it's precinct-led and community-led. It's finding uh, the, uh, the issues the community has, has different, it's trying to find different things to collaborate with the, the communities. Um, it's, you know, prioritizing the issues most important to them, then we convene a team, then we get the appropriate community members, cure violence, that's the right people for that issue, um, other agencies on the ground, NGOs, and we formulate a plan and take action and try to hold each other, each other to, you know, address the situation, whether it's, whether it's you know, chronic joblessness, graffiti, sanitation issues, um, it could be gun violence, it could be uh, nightclubs, nightclubs, yeah. youth, youth, youth yeah. issues, whatever it is. And the goal is to do that. I'm so relieved to hear that because I definitely misheard you, Inspector Kleck. So um, that's great news. Um, and uh, it really sounds robust. I appreciate how you're describing it and really makes sense. Do you... Um, would it be possible to share with the council the 100 precincts that you think are sort of next in line to do this sort of thing and the status of implementation? And then to go back for a second, are you continuing to do this in um, council member Alika Amprey Samuel's district? So I can provide you the list of initiatives that are ongoing at the moment or have yeah. Yeah. ongoing. I have to get back to you on the status of the initial 73rd Street precinct pilot. I know initial, initially it's uh, a week to 10 days um, of sort of throwing a lot of resources at the community, um, but I don't, I'll have to find out what, what the follow up after that. Yeah, and so um, that week to 10 days that happens and then does it happen again like a month later or six months later? So it can and and that's part of the idea is to keep it ongoing and make sure there's uh, you know there's accountability on it but I for that specific program I have to find out exactly what's happened since then but EREM can be ongoing it can be a one-day park cleanup and then it's done or an annual an annual park or it could be you know, a daily thing. It could, there's a lot of ways it can help address address me, um, but it's not um, it's it has to be one day or one one initiative, one shot at the initiative. Got it. My time's expired, but I really would love um, to. I think the public would be interested in learning more. It's it sounded like a super successful program in her district, but. Um, yeah, I would just love to see more of it. And um, I think, yeah, I think I think that was just so great. And, and I'm glad to hear you're doing it in more districts and would love sort of some, you know, a better understanding of what's happening there and in other districts. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Levin, go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner, and um, and your entire team. 
and <clears throat> I think my first question will be to um, Executive Director Solar from Mach J, because uh, Councilmember Holden had asked about metrics for crisis management, um, and Commissioner, you had said that 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 might be a question best directed to Mach J. So, could um, uh, could Director Solar speak to that? Is that possible? Of uh, of uh, what what type of metrics? Um, Mache uses and um, you know how how integral those metrics are into determining uh, you know, the expansion of the program or the overall efficacy of the program. You need to unmute. Thank you, Council Member. Apologies, I was on mute and I could not address your question. So, MACJ keeps internal statistics and information and qualitative and quantitative metrics about the, about the program. We also do that in partnership with external uh, evaluators. And so, I will refer to both. So, the first thing, very quickly, is we have seen from the period prior to the pandemic, a overall a in reductions in gun violence and specifically shoot and injuries related to shootings uh, than is seated in other parts of the city, those CMS sites. Right now this year, for instance, we see CMS sites and are down over 20% in the catchment areas compared to other parts of the city. And a evaluations from in, independent evaluators, as I said, from John Jay and other centers okay. have studied this issue and they have found both reductions in shootings, reduction in injuries, reductions in the stabbings and a much smaller reductions in other crime indicators. But they also have seen two other mm -hmm. things, very positive indicators that we track regularly, which is a, the predisposition of people to cooperate with the police, to call 911, et cetera and the willingness or uh, to carry less weapons. All those indicators, in, the, all the, in all those cases, the data that we have available suggests that a CMS is having yes. an impact. Is that for that reason, and we submitted a grant to the feds, a, and we are all one of the eight national finalists in an innovation grant a, under the CIPRA program, the, under the Justice Department and the Department of Treasury program. And a, we presented a whole set of statistics showing the evidence of why the program we think is working. And they accepted, they made us finalists, a group of external evaluators from the feds review the data and agree with us that the program is effective. I can definitely share with you more details, yep. uh, but I think that is the top bottom line and I wanted to, top lines and I wanted to highlight here. Okay. Um, so like, can I just there? Yeah, sure. Sure. So, you know, from from the, the law enforcement perspective, one 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 of it that makes this very difficult is that there's there's like a layered approach here. So it's getting the community involved, getting the clergy involved, the violence interrupters involved. But there's but there's also decision policing piece. So the, you know, pretty significant significant gang takedowns in towns in these areas. I think the true test will be when 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 no longer a need for one of those gang takedowns to come to come down because we certainly see like the violence drive down down after the takedown when we get to a point where you don't need the takedown to occur in the first place i think that's where we're we'll be where we all we all want yeah. <clears throat> no I, I appreciate that it's um it's kind of uh you know um success as a you know whatever the the cliche is that success as a thousand fathers you know so it's it, 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 i think that there's there's a there's a um uh, uh i think that i think that you could probably look at um i think that i i would think that the, the the best thing to look at is the is the level of coordination um between uh crisis the crisis management system and 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 uh the precincts where they're where they exist yes. um yeah. It, 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 I, it, one other question I have, and this is kind of a, a broader question, and um, is one where I I do think that law enforcement has its limitations. Time expired. Is 
how how are we getting to young people before gang involvement? Because Commissioner, you mentioned gang takedowns. Gang takedowns are there. That's pretty late in in um. It's pretty late in the process of of someone's of someone's gang affiliation. If they're involved in a gang takedown, they've been part of a, a gang for an extended period of time. Um, you know, uh, I had a, a small incident at um, I visited Rikers the other day and had a small incident. Um, uh, you know, where I, I got splashed. But um, when I was talking to um, the the doc personnel and staff that were with me at the time and this was this was in the area that's replacing solitary confinement one of the issues that that they mentioned to me was that everybody that was in that housing unit had a gang affiliation and um and one of the challenges that they see is that this is this is the staff that that i was talking with was that in a lot of ways, the gang affiliation takes um, their own personal agency. It takes over their own personal agency in, in ways. So they, they, if they're in, if they participated in a slashing in, in at Rikers, it was at the direction of the gang. Or if they're involved in a shooting, shooting. it's at the direction of the gang. It's not. They don't. They're not in a lot of ways, these are young people that, that are, have, whether they knew it or not, forfeited a lot of their own personal agency over to a gang. And yeah. so how, it's not just, you know, having police NYPD youth programs because they have, that's always gonna have just a limited effect, no offense, but that's just, that's gonna have a limited effect. The question is from a from a a much more um, foundational question of how are we working with young people from a young age, eight year olds, nine year olds, ten year olds, to 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 guard them against that involvement that probably comes about, you know, in middle school or early high school. Um, I mean, what's the coordination you to ask the with, question. Yeah, I mean, just said that. What's the court? What is the over? Who, what's the overall strategy, the overall strategy for preventing kids from ever getting involved in gangs in the first place? What's the overall strategy? And I, it's. I don't think it's a question for NYPD. I think it's a question, um, um, maybe for Mock J, but it's involves the Department of Education, involves DYCD. DYC. How are we looking at this as a city? So anyone can take that question. So to quote a, a, a brilliant person that I cannot put words in her mouth, but I think if Jennifer Jones Austin was here, she would agree with that, that we are not the ultimate solution here. Um, it's much broader. And I, I agree with her on that assessment when you talk about, and I think many of the speakers already today would agree with that too, where it's putting money and money into communities and schools and, and lifting people up. And that's how you around this long term. I, I think that what we are doing in the short term is important and necessary as area as well in our slice of it, but we're not the the end all be all here. As you were talking, Councilman, I, I mean, um, you know, when you're at Rikers, you're, you're generally dealing dealing with over 18 years, 18 years of what we're targeting in the work that we do is usually younger. Um, I would put it in the category of like 12 to 18, 10, 10 to eight, but a lot, of, a lot of programs from the options program to the Rockaway Colts that we're hoping to expand this year, working with the DOE into Harlem. I'm just writing down notes as I'm, I'm listening to you. The YCOs, the blue chips program that we did and we're running it again. Any, anything possible to give the kid, kids youth something positive to do, I think is, I think is a win keeping them out of the grasp of the gangs. They are, we are fighting for the same kids. The, ga the gangs are to recruit these kids. There is no way around that. 
kids I don't believe and leave and might want to join gang, join gang, want to get into trouble. They, they just need things to do. And I think that's where we all find common ground and agree. So whether, so whether it's the school programs, whether it's cops being positive role models, whether it's sports, arts, when we took over, took over part of summer, every week in the summertime, it was as much to show the people the cops are human and how to interact, but it was also to give them a safe environment. So all of that we're doing, and we look forward to partner, partner council and the rest of the city agencies to continue to do that. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Just one follow-up. Um, uh, Mr. Solar, there's a, there's a program out of Mock J that is specifically um, targeted to NYCHA developments, correct? He's it was if that was the was the baseball courts. If you're referring to that, that no, was no, no, it's a it's a it's a comprehensive sorry, Commissioner, it's a comprehensive okay. program. Um, thank you. Um, I'm mute again. Thank you. Yes, it's yes. our action plan for neighborhood. Neighborhood, the, the, right? The map program. Right. Now, how correct. how many how many map programs are there? There are. My, pro my program is in 15 one five developments across 15. the city. 15. Yes. Right. Are there more developments that could use a map program? Because I can tell you for a fact, I have a, I have a development in my district, Gowanus Houses and White House <coughs> Gardens, two developments. <coughs> and they've asked me yes. for a map program because they have, there's one at, at one Red Hook, which is nearby, but Gowanus and Wyckoff don't have a map program. And these are, these are, this is the kind of the, the broader comprehensive array of services, mental health and counseling and medical and all that stuff. They want a MAP program. So why don't we have more MAP programs? So what I can tell you is my program as with CMS is something that we track. We know the performance and we will certainly, we think has been extraordinarily successful. A, this year again, for instance, in all three key indicators that we track, shootings, murders, and indus crimes. Crime is significantly down over there. Again, external partners have done that evaluation as well and have documented the impact. It's something that I will bring and discuss certainly with the mayor and the first deputy mayor to make sure that we have an additional conversation about the fact that maybe this is a program that we might to span. Obviously, that's not my decision alone. It involves conversations with my partners as everything that we do in my office. Is it, an, is it a right funding here. issue? Is it an OMB question? No, I don't think it's just a funding issue. It's just to make sure that our programs, as you said, we want to make pro to have programs that holistically are implemented in the right way. My office, as you know, runs a lot of things, and I need to make sure that the programs that we run are run successfully. So I just need to have that conversation. Okay, because I, I mean, I'm, I'm serious that I have developments that are begging for a MAP program and don't have one. I, I hear you, and I will communicate, obviously, a, with my... A, my uh, friends at City Hall in order to have that additional conversation. But it's something that we, in order to implement something, the most important thing is that implementation is successful. And I am trying to make sure that that will happen. No, it's not just a funding issue. Okay, because lastly, I'm sorry, uh, Chair, that so I I, uh, I work with ACS a lot. I chair the General Welfare Committee. They expanded um, their, they have these, the, these primary prevention neighborhood um, pre primary prevention neighborhood centers. They, they just announced that they were expanding that from three to 30. Mm -hmm. So they're expanding by tenfold. And I think that maybe we should be looking at the MAP program in a kind of rapid expansion like that as well. So I'll leave that. I, I'll leave I, it there. I do that and we can have that conversation offline, of course. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Council Member Levin. Any other council members who would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we could call on you. Um, we're gonna do a last call for CM questions. Please uh, raise your hand if you would like to ask anything of the administration. I see Council Member Rodriguez. We will unmute you in a second. Thank you. Thank you. Starting time. As everyone knows, we always like being working together to see a reduction of police where well, we don't need it. But at the same time, we also have the reality. And I want to bring in you know, all my reality, my local community. 
where today we have this shooting that happened uh, in the last four or five months. Uh, more than from August to today, uh, five people have been killed as a result of violence in Northern Manhattan. So as we are looking to area where we don't need the presence of police officer, the department, how can we at the same time look on area where we need? Like, you know, my community at the beginning of last year had like a hundred, close to 200 police officers. And today that number have been reduced. And as a result, we have seen so many guns in the street and so much violence. So, you know, beside the question of what is the expectation that we should have in underserved communities, you know, when it comes to the epidemic of violence, that is not happening, you know, in the upper part of the city, in the upper club, but it's happening mainly in the community of color. So as everyone knows from the members of this panel, from the administration and my colleague, you know that I'm a three years a council. I've been one of those who say, if we don't need, you know, to have the NYPD doing the coalition investigation, coalition. then we should pass it to DOT. But what about communities such as Northern Manhattan that has been dealing with violence? How can we balance, reduce the NYPD role at some level at the same time that also we need to increase police presence in areas that are being infected by crimes and violence? Are we, are we unmuted? Yes, yes. Yeah, so Councilman, um, to talk specifically maybe about the three, four, I can do it off the top of my head. We, you know, we meet, we meet on a daily basis reviewing all acts of violence across the city. I could tell you that um, Manhattan has had a difficult year, yeah, now, in terms of the gun violence, not just in the three, three four, three, but from, from uh, many parts of Manhattan. I think we're back to uh, highs that we have not we have not seen in quite some time. Um, there's, a, there's a number of different things. What we what we are seeing three four specific is gang involved, and we're seeing probably some unintended consequences of uh, uh, legislation where we are, we're seeing some people, um, gangs in particular from from different blocks and different neighborhoods fighting over uh, marijuana involved money, frankly. Um, we're gonna continue to work with the, with the community up there. We, in terms of resources, what you mentioned, um, you know, we, we are equitably supplying neighborhoods across the city with resources to make sure that the resources that we get and we appreciate them all are, are distributed to do, to do our possible to keep New Yorkers safe. But I, I you know, to, to sound like a break, broken record here, but this is this needs to be addressed because it is the elephant in the room. We need people to stand up and say enough is enough with, enough with some laws. The people, the people that are out there on the, on the street carrying guns that are getting caught with guns over, over, over again. And the message that is being sent to them is there is no repercussions. And, in, and until the elephant in the room is address, addressed, we are going to continue to see unnecessarily high levels of violence that uh, councilman i don't need to tell you whether it's in a park whether it's in a street fair whether it's in, coming out of a nightclub like last night 100 200 500 people having a great time enjoying themselves themselves in the gritty in the world it only takes one person to ruin that and that's what we saw again last night a, a, a knucklehead with head with a gun that not thinking, pulling it out, and now we have multiple people shot. I, I, I could every day another story like this. We, we lost a 16-year-old a couple, uh, maybe a month and a half ago. He had been arrest, arrested three times for a gun in the last 12 months. Uh, well, can, can we expect, can we expect to see 
correct. It, it and, and increased. The person that had recently been caught twice with a gun. So it's, it defies any, <laughs> any sense of, uh, you know, you know, civil normality where, but we need more people to call it out and let's make the changes that need to be changed. Commissioner, I, I just feel that either, again, a person was killing Dagman months ago, two months ago, two, three months ago, yeah. another in 202, another in Sherman Avenue, Avenue. another by August in the same location when it shouldn't happen, you know, in two. I just feel that, and as you know, in the last year of speaking, Melissa Margarito, I was one of those who called to increase the numbers of police officers to the NYPD. So even though I'm the person who say, I think that we advocated to reduce the funding in area that was not in our assessment, you know, that we could do it without putting in risk the safety of New Yorkers. But I feel that by the time we're talking right now, 34 and 33 and all present in underserved community need to have an increase of men and women power in blue in order to be to see an increase of patrolling the street in those neighborhoods. Is that something that we should expect seeing as the neighborhoods are dealing with this epidemic of violence and gun in Northern Manhattan, other places in underserved communities? Yeah, yeah. And I hear you, I hear you Councilman, loud and clear. Um, I, I can't quote your specific numbers, but I can tell you the last couple of groups coming out of the academy, uh, Manhattan um, was not underserved. Manhattan got what, what they should have. I will take a look at the three, four, and I will have Ola get back to you today in, term, in terms of rank. I could tell you the next group of police officers that are coming out of the academy is next month. The end of October, I think we have roughly, I want to say roughly four, 400 take coming out of the academy. That's for the whole city. And we will absolutely make sure that not just the three, four, three, four, that every precinct in the city gets the resources that we have that, that they need. Um, and, and then again, uh, I'll just fall back, fall back to my comment about some of, some of the gun violence. It just does not make sense in terms of um, arresting individuals over and over again, particularly for guns. We're not talking about fair beating here. We're not talking about minor, minor, minor crimes. We're talking about, about the most violent crimes. Tell me why somebody is carrying a gun on the streets of New York City. And then, and then what we are allowing them to get caught, caught, get put back. We just arrested did some more. I believe it was a murder last week. It was a shooting. I don't know if the person died. Because tragically, there's too, there's too many of our stories. And when we, when we interviewed the person that was now under arrest, he laughed at the detective and said, no problem, I'll be back out on the street anyway. That is the thinking of the criminal element. And until, until kind of take common sense, common sense step, and it's not going to take a lot, but common sense to fix that, this will turn around in a, a real short time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember. Uh, Chair Adams, I believe we're, we're recognizing uh, Councilmember Menchaca. Um, I don't believe there's any other Councilmember questions. So, um, Chair Adams, you're uh, free to continue on with any questions, or we could close up this panel and move on to the public testimony at your discretion. Okay, I, I will. If, if there's no uh, further question from Councilmember Menchaca, I saw him a little while ago also. I'll, I'll just come circle uh, with my, my questioning because the, the topic today had to do with um, well, I'm calling it reassess because we're talking a, a, a lot about the same the same thing. Um, our, you know, from from when we started this, and the focus is to do placement in NYPD where it should be, and pull back in those areas where it should not be. And in my estimation, that would would that relates completely to my colleagues' um, question, mine also, as far as deployment of NYPD, in, in where your footprint can be reduced in areas where uh, other entities can fill in, where we can have more of the, the types of patrols that Councilmember Rodriguez is talking about uh, in the district. So what, what, what do you see, Commissioner? Uh, how do you evaluate 
whether certain areas of enforcement and or outreach can be safely served by other non-police entities? Well, I, th I think, and you're right, you are coming full circle and it's, it's a, a real good discussion to have. I think that when we, we talked about the Be Heard pilot, um, I was on record, um, you know, I've seen it from the ground floor up over the, over the course of course of my year. There's many times that the police are called to scenarios like that where it's not needed and we're probably not the best to um, be responding. So I think that, op that opportunity is why I, I, I back from the beginning. Um, I, I, I do to it eyes wide open though. It's not always as easy as it sounds to do. do. There's no doubt that there's opportunities to gain there. Um, homeless services is another one. I mean, those changes were made last year, uh, Chair, to take the police out of that. But I would ask everyone on this call right now, and I would ask the public, are we happy with how it's gone? Uh, and I, and I, I don't think that the public is answering the affirmative to that. So whatever, I, I would say this, whatever we decide to take the police out of, there, need, there needs to be real clear uh, accountability to, to make sure the public safety or quality of life is not negatively affected by that transfer. Um, and then we will be wholeheartedly heartedly willing partners to participate in a possible. But, you know, when, when you look at, at some of the things that happened over the last year, whether it's the homeless was taking the police out of peddlers, but the problem chair is there is that police were taken out of the peddlers but the public was, uh, you know, you know, coming to our community council meetings, coming to our Zoom meetings, coming to me personally, and this is all over New York City. And saying, and we remember what happened with uh, from the Bronx last last year. People were complaining then. Okay, why is the police not doing anything? Anything with us? Well, the answer was because the police were taking out of the peddlers. But then we had to step back in. So we've seen situations like that over and over play out. Midtown Manhattan was another example. Uh, the business districts across New, across New York. So whatever decisions are made to identify opportunities for the police, we'll work uh, hand in hand with the council uh, uh, on that. Just have to make sure that then there's metrics to make sure that there's no loss, no loss in life. Yeah, I, I do not disagree with anything that you've said, Commissioner. Um, so with that, I, I just want to thank, thank you and um, yeah. for being with us this morning. Thank you all for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair, as always. Uh, thank you, Chair Adams, and thank you, uh, members of the administration for testifying. Um, we will now be moving on to the public testimony section of this hearing. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike in a typical council hearing, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. The council members who have questions for a particular panelist use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. Uh, for panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and you may begin delivering your testimony. Um, we will be giving uh, members of the public two minutes to speak, So, and also as a reminder, everyone should submit written testimony, so uh, let's try to keep the... Um, uh, spoken testimony uh, concise and uh, you could submit any other additional information uh, via the testimony at NYC council.nyc.gov website. Um, to start, we are going to begin with. Um, I'm going to interrupt because I don't know if Council Member Gibson was recognized, so I recognize Council uh, Gibson being present in the hearing as well. Thank you, Josh. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, bear with me. Um, to begin, we will start first with. I believe she should be here. Um, Eliana Mendez Penate from the Communities United for Police Reform, followed by Quadira Coles from G Girls for Gender Equity. So, Eliana, are you uh, on and we can unmute you? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Adams, for organizing this hearing and for inviting us to testify. And thank you to the Public Safety Committee and Council Members Gibson, Levine, Miller, Menchaca, Powers, Rosenthal, Rodriguez, Holden, and Yeager. And also thank you to the Public Advocate. My name is Ileana Mendez Peñate, and I'm in testifying on behalf of Communities United for Police Reform. 
Communities United for Police Reform seeks to end abusive policing and runs coalitions of over 200 national, state, and city organizations, in addition to community education and organizing. CPR's work has included winning key legislation, including running campaigns that repealed 50A, created a special prosecutor for police kidnappings in state law, and leading the campaigns for the Community Safety and Right to Know Acts in the City Council. Reducing the NYPD's outside scope of responsibilities and bloated budget is crucial to public safety. Over the last six years, the NYPD budget has actually grown over $1 billion, while key social service agencies like the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Homelessness, the Department of Youth and Community Development are continuing to struggle to meet the needs of New Yorkers. This past June, in the fiscal year 22 adopted budget, we actually included over $11 billion in police funding. And this includes $5 billion that's solely for police fringe and pension costs. Uh, it was unfortunate to hear today that some council members are still under the false impression that the NYT budget was cut by a billion dollars because it was not. Um, right now, one in six municipal workers are employed by the NYPD, and the city spends more in fringe and benefit expenses for the NYPD personnel than it actually does in the NYPD expense budget. Um, it's problematic that instead of making a diverse living wage employment pathways available, Black and Latinx New Yorkers are essentially being told that the only ways to secure a job with critical benefits is to join the police force. We need to prioritize public safety by creating more jobs, uh, more jobs strong benefits in sectors like affordable housing, protections against climate crisis, few security, mental health services, um, and infrastructure that will increase the immediate and long-term safety of our communities. In particular, today's discussion around mental health, we wanted to address that we need a robust mental health services, and we need to remove completely NYPD completely from mental health response. The NYPD has a documented history of responding to people in crisis with violence. This past Saturday marked nine years since Mohammed Ba was killed by the NYPD while experiencing mental health crisis. Unfortunately, the Mayor's Be Heard program, which claims to remove the NYPD from mental health, actually continues to center the authority and the judgment of the NYPD instead of leading with a public health approach in responding to crisis. Mental health is not a public safety issue and a response needs system needs to be led and designed by skilled mental health workers under the jurisdiction of the Department of Health and Mental Health. The current Be Heard program actually makes very little changes to our current system and gives us little confidence that it will decrease police violence towards people who are experiencing emotional distress. We need a mental health response system that is led by people who are experts in mental health crisis and programs that are anchored by community-based organizations that are well positioned to respond to people in crisis, but also to provide the necessary post-crisis and preventative care. Part of this means that we need to make massive investments in our mental health care structure. In order to ensure that more and more people aren't going into mental health crisis, we need to increase the services provided and available for folks, especially in Black and Latinx communities. Other opportunities that we think and we see to reduce the size and scope of the NYPD include reducing the outside police presence at community events, at rallies, and at protests. We saw during the protest of the spring of 2020 the unnecessary use of force by the NYPD during many peaceful events especially by NYPD units that have a documented history of abuse, such as the Strategic Response Group. Um, we want to see units like the Strategic Response Group that was responsible for the death of Sahid Vassal and like the Vice Unit who have documented uh, tracks of abuse to be not only disbanded, but for those funds to be redirected towards public services. I know I'm over time, so thank you so much for the council for listening to this testimony and for having this hearing today. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, next, we'll be going to Quadira Coles from Girls, um, sorry about that, for uh, Girls for Gender Equity, followed by Andrew Case, Latino Justice. Sorry, John. Good afternoon, Chair Adams, members and staff of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Cordera Coles and I'm the Policy Manager at Girls for Gender Equity. We are offering testimony today to reiterate that police officers do not keep young people safe. Instead, they exacerbate and escalate issues that lead to harmful 
and long-term collateral consequences for you. This school year, New York City has still has the opportunity to shape a new experience for students coming out of remote learning brought on by the pandemic. There is still time to block the growth of the NYPD school policing division and reject the recruitment of 250 new cops, new school cops. There is still time to curtail NYPD's budget and block the creation of the new policing division inside of the DOE, a misguided project that still maintains the premise of punishment and surveillance. There were two budget cycles that passed during the pandemic where the city council did not act in favor of the young people in New York City who have said that policing calls causes them harm now and will neg negatively impact their futures. The prevention of harm and the goal of safety have rarely been successful with the use of police. It is in the police training and purpose to enforce unjust laws and protect the interests of those in power. None of these things cater to the needs of students. The city council should be thinking about ways to prevent further harm by supporting transformative and holistic methods that have been proven to get to the underlying causes of conflict and violence in lieu of retributive punishment and intimidating day-to-day -day surveillance. GGE and advocates who work closely with young people have shown up to many of these hearings and put forward solutions that will eliminate this perceived need for schools, public spaces, and youth field spaces to be saturated with police officers. We have proposed budget cuts that will allow for more money to be sent on sustaining citywide restorative practices, hiring emotional support staff, and building school infrastructure that prioritizes the social and emotional development of students. We and many young people have asked for universal SYEP programs to allow to allow students to provide supplementary supplementary income for their families and build on their professional development and pre preparation for their futures. In response to the youth demanding the total dismantling of the NYPD school policing division and protesting in the streets with calls to action to defund the police, we are seeing the new a new NYPD run youth programs like NYPD Kids First, in addition to expanding partnership with the DYCD to bolster youth surveillance and recruitment simultaneously. The NYPD's budget continues to go unscathed, which allows for new hires, positions, and expansions. We have had enough of the total control given to the NYPD through bloated budgets and dangerously thought out delegation of city responsibilities. We demand that the city council work to end all youth surveillance expansion efforts by the NYPD and remove school safety agents from schools permanently. There are community programs and care workers that deserve the responsibility and funding to serve the young people of New York City. There should be an investment in career readiness programs that do not involve working for the NYPD. There should be programs that allow young people to explore their skills and talents instead of youth policing initiatives that reinforce obedience. Young people deserve space to channel their energy towards activities that bring them whole wellness instead of force affiliation with the same systems that perpetuate harm. There are members of our community who do not work in a law enforcement capacity who are eager and deserve the opportunity to work with our youth with the right support. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will now move on to Andrew Case from Latino Justice, followed by Jared Trujillo from the New York uh, Civil Liberties Union. Starting time. Dear Chair Adams and members of the Committee on Public Safety, I'm Andrew Case, Senior Counsel at Latino Justice, and I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify about reducing the responsibilities of the NYPD. In our written testimony, we endorse removing the NYPD from responding to those in mental crisis, those suffering addiction from traffic and transit enforcement, from First Amendment demonstrations, and from aggressive enforcement of quality of life offenses, a continuation of the discredited broken windows theory of policing. But this morning, I would like to expand the definition of what responsibilities means and urge you to support efforts to eliminate one such responsibility, the so-called criminal group database or the gang database. The NYPD should not be responsible for conducting surveillance on thousands of Black and Latinx youth based on sketchy investigative evidence. The gang database expanded rapidly under Mayor de Blasio, and the criteria used to identify someone as a gang member are comically vague. Use of social media playing video games, staying out late, or wearing clothes that are, quote, black, gold, yellow, red, purple, green, blue, white, brown, khaki, gray, orange, or lime green. 
Even associating with someone on the database can get you placed in the database yourself. And the process for removing people from the database is shrouded in secrecy. And despite well publicized incidents involving white supremacist gangs in New York, over 99% of those listed in the database are black or Latinx. Being placed in the gang database can be devastating. A person arrested for a minor offense can find himself under extra scrutiny once in police custody if he is identified as being in the database. For immigrants, a gang label can result in denial of an asylum claim or revocation of special immigrant status. You could even find yourself in Rikers and have a corrections officer tell a visiting city council member you are a gang member to get him to think the NYPD should start intervening in the lives of ever younger children. Time expired. As most of you know, Councilmember Reynoso is introducing a bill to bar the NYPD from using the gang database. Latino Justice wholeheartedly supports this effort. We ask you to consider eliminating the gang database as a key plank in reducing the NYPD's responsibilities. Thank you very much. Mr. Case, I, I want to thank you personally for your testimony. Um, I share a lot of your concern. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we'll go to the New York League of, um, or the New York Civil Liberties Union with uh, Jared Trujillo, followed by, I believe, one of your colleagues also signed up. Um, Jared, you could go ahead. I'll, I'll have to next after. Uh, thank you, Chair Adams, uh, and thank you for holding this meeting and for let, allowing us to testify. Uh, my name is Jared Trujillo. I'm policy counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union. And while we submitted extensive testimony about all the different areas of the NYPD uh, that need to be uh, eliminated uh, and defunded, I want to specifically speak about uh, the NYPD's Vice Enforcement Division. Um, for decades, uh, we've known that Vice has just perpetrated an immense amount of harm on so many communities, particularly Black communities, Brown communities, and Asian communities. Uh, this is no real surprise to the city council or to the public. Back in 1972, under the Mullen Commission, we really we knew that vice officers were weaponizing their badges to terrorize, to exploit, uh, to sexually assault black women, Asian women, and brown women. Um, we, we knew the same information when the city council held a hearing on resolution 1444, calling on the state uh, to pass the walking while trans ban, we knew what vice officers were doing to communities. Um, we know that even in 2017, when vice allegedly started focusing on trafficking, that same year, there were multiple vice officers that were caught running prostitution rings. There was a vice officer that chased uh, Yang Song through her death uh, two years later. There was yet another vice officer uh, who was caught weaponizing his badge to exploit sex workers, uh, only to arrest them anyway. Uh, this isn't a matter of rebranding. Vice needs to be eliminated. And not only must vice be eliminated, but we, meet, we need to make sure that those funds go to some of the same community groups that have been elevating the folks that have been long targeted and brutalized by vice officers. That's ensuring that in the city sex worker center uh, that we take vice's $18.2 million budget and ensure that we have competent language services, legal services for people, economic empowerment services for people that are most likely uh, to be sex workers, to be massage workers, or to Talk be uh, people that are, are, uh, are at risk for exploitation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next we'll hear from Isabel Ilieva, also from uh, NYCLU, followed by Matteo Guerrero from um, Make the Road, I believe. Thank you, and thank you for having this Sorry, hearing John. and allowing us to testify. Um, I'm here to talk about the Strategic Response Group. My name is Isabel Leva. I'm an organizer with the New York Civil Liberties Union. Um, in 2015, the NYPD's history of aggressive protest policing took on its newest form with the SRG, or the Strategic Response Group. In 2020, this unit's brutality was in public view when it deployed militarized tactics against nonviolent protesters. The SRG is a threat to the safety and First Amendment rights of New Yorkers. Combating this threat means putting an end to the SRG itself. Formed in 2015 in the wake of the Ferguson uprisings, it was a 350 officer unit with a budget of 13 million. Designed to deal with terror threats and protests, the SRG's mission made a dangerous conflation between terrorism and First Amendment protected protest. After pushback, the NYPD announced that the unit would not be deployed at protests. Instead, it would solely focus on terror work. Despite that promise, the unit was deployed to protest months later, 
and its budget ballooned to 90 million in its first year. Currently, the NYPD's public description of the unit does not include counterterrorism, but it does include protests. The SRG is trained to see racial justice protesters as enemy combatants. In the unit's training manual, protest groups are divided into two categories, peaceful and violent. Examples of violent protesters are BLM, Occupy Wall Street, and anti-Trump demonstrators. The NYPD's actions last summer have been the subject of numerous lawsuits and investigations. Central to many of these is the SRG. Between June 2020 and January 2021, Nightglue protest monitors witnessed 39 instances of police arresting protesters, 25 instances of use of force, and 23 instances of kettling or trapping protesters for arrest. The SRG was present and participating in every instance of arrest, every instance of kettling, and all but one instance of use of force. In December of 2020, the Department of Investigation report called on the NYPD to reevaluate the SRG's role in protest response. The NYPD then issued a new policy on First Amendment activities. In developing this policy, the department failed to address the SRG's role and skipped over a critical question. Is First Amendment activity an area in which police should have primary responsibility at all? Instead Time of grappling explained. with that question, New York City continues to entrench police as the default response to First Amendment activities, and the NYPD refuses to hold itself accountable. City leaders must step in to protect the safety and First Amendment rights of New Yorkers by disbanding the SRG and ensuring that the unit's militarized tactics are not recreated under another name. Instead, its funds should be reinvested in ways that support and uplift New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal has her uh, hand raised. Uh, do you have a question, Councilmember? I do. Um, hang on one second. I just want to ask this panel, and I've been listening um, in what they thought of the, um, and perhaps the last panel as well, um, of the program that was implemented in Lika Ambry Samuels district and whether or not they watched that and, and saw um, any successes there. Um, I know there was somebody from Girls from Gender Equity on and NYCLU, I do, I, I'm sorry, I'm on my telephone, so it's hard to see exactly who's available, but maybe they could raise their hand um, for one of the panels. Thank you, Josh. Sure. Um, bear, bear with us for a second. Um, does, does anyone who just spoke, uh, Girls for Gender Equity, is uh, Quadira Cole still on? Um, or uh, Eliana, or anyone who had just previously spoken wants to kind of chime in on um, Answering uh, Chair Rose or Councilmember Rosenthal's question, um, feel free to make yourself known. Thank you, and I would broaden it even to say, do you know about it? They they talked about that program expanding into a hundred other. I, I couldn't quite tell precincts or districts whether or not you've seen that in your in any particular communities. And if you've not, that's an answer too. Okay, we need to move on to the next panelist. All right then, um, we'll move on to uh, make the road, I believe. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, sorry about that, everyone. Um, uh, Matty Guerrero, I believe that you are uh, next. Um, and any other folks from Make the Road who are testifying uh, with you or after you, we'll, we'll proceed after you. Go ahead. Um, thank you. And I will be providing interpretation for the members from Make the Road. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mateo Guerrero Tavares. Um, I am the TNCIQ lead organizer at Make the Road New York, and I am here to testify on the importance of defunding the NYPD. And in particular, in particular to dismantle the vice units. The vice unit is a squad uh, that is tasked with policing offenses in, in morals, such as consensual sex work, street level narcotics use, and gambling. However, over the past four years that I have been working at Make the Road with undocumented and immigrant, immigrant transgender women in Jackson Heights and different areas of Brooklyn, 
we have been able to document a pattern of harassment, surveillance, sexual assault, and violent rates against communities who are perceived as sex workers or who are sex workers, particularly from the 110th and the 115th precinct. Today, um, we're gonna hear stories from Veronica, from Kathy, and from Jennifer. Those are three testimonies out of the thousand community members who were told to perform sexual favors, and by that I mean sexual assault, uh, so that they wouldn't be arrested. Um, or those who were to, uh, forced to tell on the names and locations of other sex workers in the neighborhood to prevent their arrest. These are not the only tactics of intimidation that police uses against transgender women and sex workers and folks who are perceived as sex workers. The police also follows them around the neighbor, neighborhood with flashing lights um, until they get to their homes. And they usually increase the level of harassment around four in the morning when the clubs are closing in the area. This behavior from the vice units and in general from the NYPD is terrorizing and only continues to instigate fears in our, in our community. Nearly 93% of vice targets for purchasing sex are black, brown, or Asian, while 90% of those targeting, uh, targeted for selling sex are people of color. Almost all of the people uh, vice officers prey upon are from low-income neighborhoods such as Jackson Heights um, and Sunset Park areas in Fifth Avenue in Brooklyn. Under Major Bill de Blasio, New York City paid more than one million to settle false arrest claims, false arrest claims by people targeted for patronizing. As Major New York, we demand the dismantling and disbanding of the vice units to prevent further harassment, assaults, violence, and criminalization of trans, queer, non-binary, gender expansive community members who are sex workers or who are perceived as sex workers. It is essential that the funding that has been used for the vice units is moved into community programs, housing vouchers, and social work support for our communities. Thank you everyone for putting this hearing together. And I think that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mateo, thank you. Um, it, Mateo, so if you could stay, yeah, we'll leave you unmuted and you could provide translation services for the folks on your end. Is that how you, you'd like to go about that? Um, they can speak and then I will read it in English. Okay, yeah, just, uh, we will um, we'll go about uh, Veronica first and then I believe Jennifer after that. So the two of you can deliver your testimony and then afterwards we'll switch back to you. Um, I believe Josh, there's also, yes, ma'am. Josh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think if, if Helen is still on, perhaps Ileana's hand is raised to address uh, Helen's um, question. Okay, we could, yeah, question. if you'd like that, we could shift back. We'll shift back, sorry, sorry about that. Um, to uh, Veronica and Jennifer. I think we're gonna to try to switch back now to answer the, the council members questions from, from before, and then we'll continue after that. Um, so if we could uh, just bear with us for a second, please. Um, we'll we'll uh, now, um, I believe. Great. Ileana, Ileana, go ahead, sorry, yes. Thank you about, thank you for that. I apologize, I was having trouble unmuting myself earlier. Um, to address your question, council member Rosenthal, um, we believe that those programs are successful uh, in large part because it was community groups, including cure violence groups, that were really given uh, the jurisdiction and allowed to respond and de-escalate incidents. And um, the NYPD um, really doesn't need to have a role in this. There's a there's a strong uh, there's a lot of data that documents how successful these programs have been um, and that we have confidence that an expansion of these programs would be the right move in terms of increasing community safety uh, in these neighborhoods. Um, but part of that needs to be uh, that the role and authority of the NYPD needs to be decreased to allow those programs to be successful. Thank you, Ileana. I hope Councilmember Rosenthal uh, heard it. I'm, I'm texting her to make sure that she that she heard your response. Thank you so much for that. Chair, Councilmember Rosenthal has given the thumb of approval, so she heard. Um, we will continue uh, on with uh, Jennifer and uh, Veronica from Make the Road, and then Mateo, you're uh, available afterwards to to provide any uh, translations as needed. So. Um, we will unmute you and then you could be, begin. That's Jennifer. Okay. 
Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Jennifer Lorellana, soy una mujer trans puertorriqueña y líder comunitaria de diferentes organizaciones. Y hoy estoy participando como líder del proyecto Trans Immigrant de Made the Road. En los años 90 comple completé mi, mi titular de enfermería y comencé a ejecutar mi carrera en hospitales locales. Mas sin embargo, debido a la discriminación de ser por mi orientación sexual y mi identidad de género, tuve que dejar la enfermería e emigrar a Nueva York para dedicarme a hacer el sexo servicio, una de las profesiones más antiguas del mundo. Ser trabajadora sexual me ha dado la libertad de ser mi propia jefa y tener una estabilidad económica, no solo a mí, sino también a mis familiares. Mas, sin embargo, lo más difícil de mi profesión, como una trabajadora sexual, lo que me produce más intranquilidad y temor es el constante acoso policial y el miedo de ser arrestada. Mi último arresto fue en el 2018, cuando estaba con un hombre que era policía encubierto. Todavía no había entrado a la habitación cuando de la nada cuatro, ocho policías violentamente tumbaron la puerta de mi entrada del apartamento y le realizaron un arresto mucho más fuerte de lo que había esperado, incluso mucho peor de lo que veíamos en televisión. Este arresto fue muy humillante. El escándalo de la policía fue tan grande que hasta mis vecinos se enteraron y de esto me trajo problemas de vivienda. El casero intentó echarme de mi apartamento por ser trabajadora sexual y me tocó luchar por más de ocho meses para que la corte me permitiera no ser desalojada. No tengo duda que el escuadrón que rompió mi puerta y desordenó mi apartamento creo que fue un escuadrón de, de Vice. Mi historia no es la única y muchas mujeres trans pueden testificar de la forma violenta y abusiva que se comporta la policía de Nueva York, especialmente la policía. Esta vigilancia policial constante crea inseguridad para nosotras como sexo sexual, que produce estereotipos falsos sobre nuestro trabajo. No nos, nos ponen en riesgo frente a personas civiles que alrededor de nosotras se identifican como sexo servidora públicamente y últimamente nos pone en riesgo de perder nuestra vivienda. Por eso estoy aquí, porque exijo que desmantelen las unidades de madre para que las personas que han sobrevivido del tráfico humado, humano y las personas que somos trabajadoras sexuales y las personas que somos perseguidas por, como trabajadoras sexuales no sean victimizadas de la violencia y por el abuso policial de la unidad. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Jennifer, for, gracias por compartir, Jennifer, para poder traducir tu testimonio. So I'm going to interpret Jennifer's testimony. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Orellana. I'm a Puerto Rican transgender woman and a community leader in different groups. And today I'm participating as a leader from Make New York, the Trans Immigrant Project. In the 90s, I managed to complete my nursing degree and began my career as a nurse in local hospitals. However, due to the discrimination based on my sexual orientation and my gender identity, I had to leave nursing and I had to migrate to New York to start doing sex work, one of the oldest professions in the world. Being a sex worker gave me the freedom to be my own boss and to have financial stability, not only for myself, but also for my family members. However, the most difficult thing about my profession as a sex worker and what causes me the most um, uneasiness and fear is the constant police harassment and the fear of being arrested. My last arrest was in 2018 when I was uh, with a man who ended up being an undercover cop. We had not yet entered my room when a police when a police officer violently smashed the front door of my apartment and arrested me in a harsher way I could have ever expected, even much worse than what we see on TV. This arrest was very humiliating. The police scandal was so so loud that even my neighborhood, my neighbors found out, and this led to many housing problems. The landlord tried to kick me out of my apartment for being a sex worker, and I had to fight for more than eight months in court to not be evicted. I have no doubt that the squad that broke the door, messed up my apartment, and created a scandal in my building was a vice unit. My story is not unique, and many trans women can testify to the violent and abusive way in which the NYPD, especially the vice units, behave. The constant police surveillance creates insecurity for us as sex workers, reproduces false stereotypes about our work, puts us at risk, risk in front of other civilians that start identifying us as sex workers, and ultimately puts us at risk of losing our homes. 
That is why I'm here to demand that we dismantle the vice units so that people who have survived sex trafficking, people who are sex workers, and people who are perceived as sex workers are not victims of the violence and police abuse of that unit. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Veronica, you could go ahead and Mateo, you're available to translate uh, when, after that's completed. Thank you. Um, good morning to all the city council and community members who are present in today's hearing. My name is Veronica and I am a member of the Chan Immigrant Project at Make the Road New York. I am originally from Puebla, Mexico, but I have been in the United States for over 25 years. Today's hearing on removing responsibility from the NYPD is particularly important to me because my experiences with the police, I am a trafficking survivor and I am here to attest that my experiences with the vice units were outraging and traumatizing. The night that I was arrested, there were several male officers that put their hands on me who laughed at my gender identity and who didn't even see my humanity. Never through that arrest did anybody care to ask why I was trading sex in that moment or how I was feeling. The arrest was completely dehumanizing. And then the judicial process that followed was even more terrorizing. The case, the case lasted over a year and a half where I had to constantly interact with the police and the judge and had to revive very difficult memories over and over again. I also had to deal with the contrast, with the contest, constant pressure from the police and the judge to admit guilty to being a sex worker, even though in that moment I was being trafficked. Because of the arrest and the court process, I had a criminal record and a barrier to ask employment and securing housing. During this time, because of finances, I had to move in with my family, where I had to cut my hair, dress and act like I meant to be, to be have a to have a place to stay. This whole experience was very tra traumatic for me. Even until this day, I am terrified to see a police officer near me. I start shaking and I get very nervous. What I needed at the moment was community service, services and access to a social worker who could support me. I needed someone to listen to me and voucher to permanent housing, not police officers laughing at me. I know this is the case for many more transgender women who like myself have experienced the abuse and violence from the vice units and in general, the NYPD. I am testifying as someone who survived trafficking and also someone who, who was a sex worker. And I demand that we dismantle the vice units so that people who have survived sex trafficking like me, people who are sex workers and people who are perceived as sex workers are not further victimized and traumatized by the police. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for your testimony. Um, can we go ahead and, and unmute Mateo? Do you have anything further to add? Um, I see your hand is raised. Yes, uh, we have the testimony for one more member. Uh, she had to step out because she needed to do something and within this window of time, and I, I wanna be able to read it because it's really important um, for, for this hearing. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, to all the city council members and people in the community who are in attendance. My name is Kathy Garcia, and I am a member of Make Through New York Trans Immigrant Project, and I am here to share my experiences with the police and the importance of dismantling device units. I'm originally from Mexico, but I immigrated to the United States for the first time in 2001. Initially, I started working in a restaurant, which unfortunately closed after 9-11. Since then, as a transgender woman, I was not able to find another job, and I no longer had any money to pay for food or for rent. So I started working, doing shows in bars, and also doing sex work again. It didn't matter if I was working or not, the police were constantly harassing me, insulting me, kicking me out of cafeterias if I was sitting there for more than five minutes, putting their lights from their cars on me and telling me to leave. The police used very intimidating tactics against me. Different policemen asked me for my phone number and told me that I needed to cooperate with them so that they wouldn't arrest me. What that meant is that they showed up in my house for me to have sex with them. The, the, these same police, this, these same policemen would put their gun on the table and tell me that I needed to cooperate. And then the times that I didn't follow upon their request for their sexual favors, I was arrested. There were a total of three arrests for sex work between 2003 and 2006. In the last arrest, a man who I later discovered was an undercover cop offered me to drive me home and offer me money. 
I told him, uh, I don't do that. What are you doing? But in a matter of seconds, there were three police cars surrounding us. This resulted in four, four months in jail and then my deportation. Due to this arrest, I was in solitary confinement for several months without access to hormones and almost dying of pneumonia that was not treated until I arrived in Mexico. I have no doubt that the cars that surrounded me were police officers from the vice unit. Vice does not protect the communities that are being trafficked and much less any of us who identify as sex workers. What vice does is to commit acts of violence and unjustified against many of us who are trying to survive. I demand that the city council considers my testimony so that vice units are removed and more transgender women and members of the community don't have to face the violence and abuse from the police. Nowadays, I am afraid of seeing the police and I do not want more trans sisters to go through this experience. Dismantle the vice units now. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal had her, her hand raised. Do you, do you have a question or no? Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, well, well, next gonna move on to uh, Jordan Otis from the Center for Code of Innovation, followed by Rohini Singh from Advocates for Children. Uh, Jordan, you may begin. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, Chair Adams and esteemed council members of the Public Safety Committee. My name is Jordan and I'm the Associate Director of Community Programs at the Midtown Community Court, a project of the Center for Court Innovation. I'm here to, today to discuss two of the Center's community-based programs that work to provide an alternative to police interaction through community investment. The first is Community First. Led by MCC, Times Square Alliance, Breaking Ground and Fountain House, piloting in the Times Square area and the surrounding neighborhoods. We launched in January and Midtown Community Corps has brought together the previously mentioned organizations with city agencies such as DHS, DOHMH, and HRA to connect individuals, most of whom are experiencing homelessness to the critical services uh, that are needed, um, excuse me, critical services that will help them avoid the justice system involvement. Led by a team of community navigators with lived and shared experiences, this project links individuals to services before their behavior leads to police interaction by building a trusting relationship and becoming their support system. Our efforts have led to folks on our caseloads being connected to housing, reunifying with family, connections to mental health, physical health, and general wellness services, benefits enrollments, COVID vaccinations, and more. But when people do find themselves involved in the justice system, we hope to provide support at the precinct level, as well as through a new initiative called Midtown's Rapid Engagement, uh, Rapid Engagement Initiative. This initiative seeks to do four things. The first, connect people to a defense attorney on the day of their arrest. Two, conduct a media eligibility check for pre-arraignment diversion options offered by the DA's office, such as Project Preset and or Hope. Three, provide support to people so they don't miss their arraignment date. Four, link people to social service sessions within the 21 day period between arrest and arraignment. We believe this program can connect people to services and resources that effectively keep uh, them from justice involvement. We have been piloting the rapid engagement initiative since March in collaboration with the Midtown North Precinct, but a rapid engagement or peer navigator based in the precinct to meet with folks who are arrested and released with a desk appearance ticket would increase our ability to effectively engage with community members in need of services. Further, it will take the responsibility of having to communicate social services and other offerings off the shoulders of the NYPD. Your help in making that happen would be tremendous. Recently, Midtown South uh, Precinct conveyed that they would like to have additional resources for those also released with DATs and will now be a partner in this initiative as well. We look forward to having further discussions with you to make this initiative a successful one. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we will go to uh, Advocates for Children, Rohini Singh, and I, I will name the following panel after that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the oh. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Rohini Singh, and I'm a senior staff attorney on the School Justice Project at Advocates for Children. For 50 years, AFC has worked to ensure high-quality education for New York City students who face barriers to academic success. We are members of Dignity in Schools New York, a coalition of youth, parents, educators, and advocates dedicated to shifting the culture of New York City schools away from punishment and from the punishment and criminalization of our youth and towards positive approaches to discipline and safety. We're testifying today to join the call from students, parents, and educators for police-free schools and urge the city to eliminate the reliance on the NYPD to address the needs of students in our schools. 
The city must provide students with safe, supportive, healing-centered school environments that have comprehensive mental health and social emotional supports and promote well-being and equity for all students and school staff. Sending police into schools and continuing to hire new school safety agents undermines this goal. Police are not mental or behavioral health professionals and should not respond to students' needs. Not only are school safety agents and other NYPD officers ill-equipped for this role, but police interventions can in and of themselves have negative effects on adolescent mental health, heightening emotional and psychological distress and resulting in feelings of social stigma. In June, AFC released a report finding that NYPD officers, including precinct officers and SSAs, responded to a total of 12,050 incidents in the last four years where a student in emotional distress was removed from school and transported to the hospital for a psychological evaluation. Mirroring trends and broader trends in policing, a disproportionate number of these interventions involve Black students, students with disabilities in District 75 schools, and students attending schools located in low-income communities of color. These students are also more likely than their peers to be handcuffed when removed from school. Safety does not exist when Black students and students with disabilities are forced to interact with a system of policing that views them as a threat and not as students and young people. Indeed, there's overwhelming evidence that these harsh responses harm children's futures and do nothing to ensure safety. When examining the role of the NYPD with the goal of reducing their responsibilities, we urge the city to remove all police from our city schools. The city must reevaluate its definition of safety in schools and listen to student, parent, and educator voices, calling for the divestment of funds from the NYPD and investment in restorative practices, healing-centered schools, and mental and social-emotional supports and services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Rohini, thank you. I'm going to ask a question because this is such such a hot topic, um, you know, for us. It has been for such a long time, and. I'm just going to throw it out there. You know, I appreciate you and organizations and the children for the testimony over the you know few months. Um, help help me to get to to this place. How do you how do you balance this with the you know the the dominant numbers of SSAs who are women of color, um, a lot of whom are single mothers. Um, and a lot of whom view these children in, in these schools as their own children who provide them breakfast in the morning, who would give the coat off their back to clothe them, um, you know, and other variables as well. So just help me, help, help me here. Well, I mean, our, our position, and, and we're very much informed by the way that youth and students uh, perceive the school safety agents in their schools. Um, I can tell you that while that might be the situation for certain school safety agents in schools, that that in our experience has not been the, the primary function of school safety agents. And as long as they are under the NYPD and NYPD officers, um, they are there as, as police in schools and they are there, you know, their presence um, in and of itself is harmful, is harmful to students as, as, as NYPD officers. I mean, often, you know, the data that we examine you know, they're getting involved in situations that um, really need to be addressed by trained mental health professionals, um, you know, essentially school staff that um, are, are, are um, approaching students in a more healing centered and restorative way and not looking at it as, um, as something punitive. And again, I, I understand that that is the perspective that some school safety agents have, but in our experience, it's, it's not necessarily the way that students perceive them and it's not the way that, that might not be the way that um, that they are in all school communities. And, and, and just one, one more, and I don't know if my, my colleagues want to, how do you gather your data and, and, and get, get the assessment and the, I guess the, the, the percentage of, you know, favorable versus unfavorable and, you know, how, how do you, how do you get that info? I mean, so we, we, we don't have the information about, and I think, you know, maybe that's part of the problem. It's so much of what's out there is anecdotal um, and there isn't sort of a widespread, you know, survey of, of how the school communities um, view school safety agents, but we do know the historic, um, you know, the historic roots of, of policing, of school policing. Um, we do know, you know, from um, our work on dignity in schools, um, the perspective of students that have interacted with school safety agents and the negative impact that it has had on them. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's where we are drawing our, um, our, our policy advocacy and where, what we're trying to, to push for. Okay, 
Thank you very much for your testimony today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your testimony. We have a council member question from uh, council member Rosenthal. After uh, council member Rosenthal asks her question, we will be moving on to uh, the following panel, which will begin with uh, Shan Huang, followed by Andy Bowen. So Chair Rosenthal, you may begin with your question and then we will follow up with um, whoever you're questions addressed to, and then move on to the following uh, testimony. Go ahead, Chair. Or Thank you so much. And um, in many ways, my question is for the folks from Make the Road who gave such compelling testimony and, you know, disheartening and heart rendering, you know, very difficult, but honest testimony. I really appreciate them. I'm not sure if they're still on or if anyone knows the folks from Make the Row. I know Mateo is always wonderful. If someone could um, text him and see if he could get back on. While I'm waiting, uh, Mr. Otis from Center for Court Innovation, I actually am gonna ask you kind of a similar question, which is, um, Uh, I first Center for Corn Innovation does such amazing work. I think if the city turned over its entire budget to you, you would solve the problem in the city. So I have full faith in your organization, what you've done. I know I've worked closely with your domestic violence group, really do wonderful work. I'm wondering in the situations that you're aware of that the representatives from Make the Road were talking about, do you know if these individuals who are treated this way are ever given an opportunity to see meet with folks at the anti-violence project or you know other trauma-informed um, counseling services, you know, crime victim treatment center? Um, I'm not sure. I think you you all might do some of that work. Um, you know, the sexual violence that we're hearing about, as ludicrous as this might sound, but, you know, how do we get the sex crimes unit, the NYPD, to step in here and um, somehow play a role in, in stopping this from happening? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, and let me start by saying thank you for the uh, kind words you led with. Um, I do want to be careful and not speak for the entirety of the center, uh, being that I'm just located at the Midtown Community Court Project. Um, but yes, you're right, we do have a hand in, in that work. Um, and through our work at Midtown, because we have come across folks, like I mentioned, in uh, through our work in Times Square and whatnot, rapid engagement initiatives, uh, and other outreach that yes, have, have been involved in sex work in different capacities and whatnot. Um, and so what we do is really try our best, just as kind of with other folks moving through the system, to connect them to very individualized services and yes. problems. And so, yeah, we have worked with a number of different uh, community-based organizations as well throughout the borough to kind of act as a liaison and make those connections. Um, when we can, we do try to bring in, whether it's... Uh, different defense agencies and whatnot into that process early on. But we, yeah, like I said, kind of act as that liaison at Midtown to make sure that all the right organizations that can help folks kind of take that off ramp of the justice system um, do so. And, and most of all, make sure it's sustainable as opposed to kind of a one-time connection, um, but something that they can actually invest in and something that uh, they, believe that they can also trust so that we can exactly. stop that kind of cyclical uh, exactly. issue that we're seeing, especially kind of in our area. You know, what I'm hearing is how do we, someone who's been traumatized in this way, right? You never get justice. You're never going to get justice. But what I'm wondering is how well the city does in providing some sort of trauma-informed services, mm -hmm. um, counseling services, and 
whether or not those services are made available to people. And I think I'm hearing you say that for the people in your orbit, that, that you do try to do that. Um, is there, go ahead. Sorry, and I, but you're spot on. And I think one thing that we've come to realize, and I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here with the other folks on the call is though, is that that trauma often leads to a distrust in systems as a whole. And often the folks that we're working with have a lot of difficulty uh, separating the social services embedded in the city from these same city agencies that may have led to that trauma in the first place. Got it. And what we've done at Midtown is really kind of grab or kind of create this team of folks with lived experience, with shared experience that are, are acting essentially as credible messengers um, and, and re relating with these folks that are coming across our paths um, in a way that is building an actual trusting relationship. So then once that service is referred, they're like, okay, this is coming from someone that I know I can trust, that it's in my support system and my support circle. And now as a result, I'm more likely to engage with this in its entirety to a point where I can actually benefit from some of these services that are offered from city agencies, community agencies, so on and so forth, as opposed to just making that referral without addressing first the trauma that came from that justice system involvement. That's right just an arrest, whether that is a uh, actual involvement throughout the court processings, so on and so forth. So we're doing a lot of our work on the front end of that outreach, making sure that that trust and that relationship is there and we're not strangers. So when ultimately that referral is made, um, everyone feels as if everyone's best interest is in mind, as opposed to being just another referral, just another okay. outcome, or just another kind of uh, deliverable, so to speak. Yeah. And are there any nonprofits you work with in particular for the trans, for transgender folks who are arrested as sex workers? We do have a couple of folks. Um, I like to lean on the experts in our, in our clinic and our social work team for those referrals. Uh, but I can certainly get to your office that, that yeah, list. No, I was just curious. That's all right. You don't have to. I mean, I know AVP does wonderful work and um, yeah. All right. And uh, thank you so much, Mr. Otis. I appreciate you as always. And did anyone from Make the Road jump on? No. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, if anyone from Make the Road signs on, we will we'll be sure to flag that for you as well. Okay. Um, next, we'll go to uh, our next panelist. We'll begin with uh, Shan Huang, followed by Andy Bowen. Starting time. All right. Thank you so much. Everyone, my name is Shan Huang. Thank you for offering the space to hear us out. Today, I represent Womankind, an organization whose mission is to use the multiple dimensions of its Asian heritage to work alongside survivors of gender-based violence. We work to create a future where we rise above violence and where our communities can innovate towards collective well-being, restoration, and social justice. I'm here today to speak about our client's experience with Vice Human Trafficking Division, especially unlicensed massage workers' experience. So first of all, although uh, we acknowledge the efforts of uh, Vice has made to hear and support survivors of human trafficking, our clients, especially unlicensed massage workers, have voiced out overwhelmingly negative impact, especially on how they were treated during and after the arrest and the amount of trauma they had to navigate through. Today, I would like to stress uh, three main things. So first, um, Vice did not make um, proactive efforts in ensuring language accessibility, let alone cultural competence. Many clients we walked with uh, do not speak English as their primary language, um, and they have expressed they were very confused about the entire process during the raids. Specifically, there were no interpreters available on site, uh, nobody was making active efforts to communicate about what's going on, not explaining to them about their rights. And many of the clients did not know by law they could get a court assigned free lawyers. They ended up hiring private lawyers and who later took advantage of those clients. Um, second, 
uh, we have been informed by our clients that some officers engage in impro inappropriate behaviors when interacting with them after the arrest. Uh, we have cases where clients were exposed to sexual jokes or insulting gestures, and they purposely, uh, purposefully across their personal physical boundaries. Um, I will list some ex specific examples in my written uh, testimony. Time expired. But I, what I want to address here is that every human being deserves respect, dignity, and equality. And third, in the case of civil forfeiture, where clients at assets, especially their earned cash, was seized by vice, clients often become entangled in the process that rights were violated. And because of their fear of getting into more trouble, clients often let it go and not want to proceed or engage further. So in summary, I wanted to address uh, that because the vulnerability of this population, many unlicensed massage workers, including survivors of trafficking, are so afraid of speaking up as they don't want to get into trouble. And our collective goal should be protecting the rights of each individual survivor. And that's the only path to restoring their dignity and giving them that opportunity they deserve to pursue a better life. So thank you so much for hearing us out today. Thank you so much for your testimony. We'll move on to Andy Bowen, followed by, bear with me for a second, uh, Lindley Egis. Andy, you may begin. Thank you. Um, My name is Andy Bowen. I am Associate Director of Government Affairs for the Sex Workers Project at the Urban Justice Center. Thank you, Chair Adams, Council Member Rosenthal, and other council members and staff present for making this here impossible. The Sex Workers Project at the Urban Justice Center, or SWP, offers legal advocacy to survivors of human trafficking and people who engage in sex work, regardless of whether they do that by choice, circumstance, or coercion. SVP argues today that one, the anti-trafficking vice unit, or ATV, as I'm told vice has been rebranded, should be disbanded. Even if ATV has reduced its prostitution-related arrests and is claiming to refocus on trafficking, it maintains officers who are violent and coercive toward trafficking survivors. Two, ATV's $18.2 million in funding, exclusive overtime, should be redistributed to organizations that truly serve and are guided by the sex work and trafficking survivor community. The stories that will reference involving trafficking are offered in fuller detail in my written testimony, along with some extra history. As to recent events, in an example that happened within the last four years and which is exemplative of a pattern be of behavior toward trafficking survivors. A trafficking survivor client brought to a service agency by ATV ultimately told the provider that they didn't want to collaborate with ATV. The provider explained this to ATV. Nevertheless, ATV officers found the client in several locations that they knew she was likely to go. If you've been continuously hounded by your trafficker, being hounded again by ATV when you've explicitly said you do not want their offers of help could be re-traumatizing. As another example of terrible treatment of trafficking survivors, this last summer, the provider told me the story of a certified trafficking survivor who completed the process of vacating her prior prostitution conviction that occurred while she was being trafficked. She was sleeping outside when she was woken up by ATV. They held her for several hours, took her medications away, called her a whore, and she was understandably quite shaken by the event. These are just some of the reasons for eliminating ATV, and I support my colleagues. I'm inspired. Speaking on calling for elimination of ATV and reinvesting of 18.2 million and overtime running and community focused needs. Um, thank you so much for your attention to these issues and holding these hearings and constantly being in conversation with our communities. Well, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, Councilmember Rosenthal, I believe she has another question. We also have uh, Mateo back from Make the Road. Um, so uh, if you want to kind of direct that question as well, go ahead, Councilmember. Thank you, I do. So if you could unmute Mateo. Um, Mateo, I just want to thank you as always um, for being so present on behalf of um, the people that Make the Road is trying to help. Um, you know, you're relaying and, and trying to help people with real trauma and you do it uh, with grace, and I really want you to know how much I appreciate you. Um, I was wondering, and and um, frankly, Andy Bowen from um, the um, Andy may also know answers to these 
questions. But I'm wondering for the people who, who you brought on today, were they ever given, have they ever been given an opportunity to work with trauma-informed, good trauma-informed counselors? Um, and is there, are there, I mean, you and I should follow up afterwards because I'm seeing you shake your head no. So, um, but are there trusted providers that make the road uh, can refer people to? Do you know about the anti-violence project or VIP, but go ahead. Yeah, um, from the city directly, we don't have uh, connections, but we do work closely with AVP. Um, so whenever we had either a case of hate violence, uh, like just in, like from civilians, we refer them to AVP. And also when we have cases of police violence, uh, we make sure that they receive immediate um, uh, social work support between six to eight weeks. Um, and then we transition them into permanent um, mental health support. Um, so we, we create those connections. But I, what I will say though, is that there are very limited resources. And this is why we need to dismantle the vice units so that we can move those fundings into community um, services that are necessary. Yeah, if you could follow up with me, I'd really appreciate that. Um, and thank you. Thanks for coming back on. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Andy, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, um, I just wanted to sort of add on, like, what I'm understanding is happening is, like, when it comes to a, I've been told that ATV will, like, have a trafficking survivor sometimes bring them to a provider um and you know that that's the story it goes more it goes deeper in my written testimony but what you see there and i'll just tell you now is that you know trafficking brings in a person the person says i don't want to work with trafficking anymore, or atv and atv like i have an msw right i was trained to have boundaries um, and what I'm being told is like, these are people, like these officers do not practice boundary control. Um, like it, it's sort of like really, really aggressive. Um, like, I mean, the story that I told my testimony was like, this is somebody who ATV keeps on going back to places they know, they know this person is at because this person has said, I don't want to work with them anymore. And so um, it's sort of like you have this group of people who think they know like what boundary control looks or they, they know what, what they're doing and they think that they're doing something really great for survivors, but it turns out that it's, it's, it's not, and it's actually really harmful. Um, and I think what Shan was also speaking to is that like, you know, then, then, you know, let's add on unlicensed massage in situations in which people are not speaking the same language as anyone who is, is the officers who come in. Um, it's just. ATV is a, is a mess, and we should right. not be trusting this this agency to be doing um, doing this trafficking work. It's not it's not therapeutic by any stretch of the imagination. Right, and and I'll just remind everybody that Councilmember Combo passed a law into at the end of two thousand eighteen, requiring the NYPD to um, get trained in trauma informed care. And uh, that training is supposed to happen on a regular basis. Um, so I just want to put that out there. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you for the time, Chair Adams. Thank you, Council Member. Um, next, we will turn to, uh, I don't know, yes, Lindley Egas, followed by uh, Alyssa Crespo. And after that, apologies, after that would be um, Melissa uh, Bruto, who I just saw signed on as well. So I just wanted to, that's the, the next three, go ahead. Thank you so Sorry much. Thank you so much. Good morning, members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Lindley Edges, and I'm the legal director at Transgender Law Center, where I've worked for the last four years. Prior to joining TLC, I worked at Sex Workers Project for almost eight years. Today, rather than talk about statistics and policies, I will share some of the experiences I've had over the last decade working with sex workers and survivors of trafficking who have interacted with the police. 
I will never forget my first interaction with Vice in New York City at the very beginning of my legal career. My client, Carla, a transgender woman who was a victim of human trafficking, was ready to file a police report. I know that police and the Vice had a history of transphobia, so I worked with the LGBT liaison who set up and attended the meeting with Vice. Unfortunately, the meeting didn't go well. Prior to the meeting, one Vice officer pulled me in the room and said, you don't really know your client. He started pointing at her rap sheet. Look, she has convictions for prostitution on her record. He shared proudly as if he solved some puzzle I didn't know existed, but I already knew about her arrest. More importantly, she had been forced into sex work, so it shouldn't be surprising to anyone that she had arrest on her record for prostitution. Needless to say, the interview did not go well. The vice officers repeatedly used homophobic and transphobic language and made it clear they did not believe Carla. After the interview, I asked for a copy of the police report. Both officers laughed and said they weren't filing a police report. They didn't believe she was a victim, despite the fact that she was held in a basement without freedom to leave, forced to have sex with men that were brought to her, and forced to do street-based sex work. When I re-emphasized these points, they said her experiences didn't fit within the definition of trafficking. Baffled, I pointed out that she was younger than 18 at the time, and even had convictions on her record prior to turning 18, and therefore, de facto, she was a victim of trafficking. The officers just looked at me and said, that's federal law, you're in New York. I left feeling defeated, like I had let down my client. I went into the uh, office well. where she was sitting and apologized. She looked at me and said, I didn't expect anything better from the police. That day is seared in my mind. I would love to tell you this was a one-time situation with Vice, but Carla's experiences are emblematic of decades of the policemen, of the treatment by the police of sex workers, especially those who are black, brown, and trans. To illustrate this point, allow me to share another example. 10 years ago, I was with a friend and colleague, Allison, who was a former sex worker and survivor of trafficking. We were doing Know Your Rights outreach in Queens. She grabbed my hand and pulled me behind a car. She whispered, Lindley, that's one of the cops who used to make me give him blowjobs when I was working on the street. Sometimes if we had sex with the police, they wouldn't arrest us, but other times they would, even if we gave them what they wanted. This has been happening for at least 25 years, and it's well known that certain precincts find this behavior acceptable by the police. Unfortunately, stories of police abuse are endless. One day, Lorena Borja showed up in my office with Erica, a transgender woman who was looking for help. This woman's face was battered and she was missing two front teeth after Vice came into her apartment and slammed her onto the floor. Rebecca is a transgender woman who was trafficked by Vice, uh, excuse me, was attacked by Vice during a client John Sting. Rebecca was on her way to get a sandwich when she walked by someone who turned out to be an undercover officer. For unknown reasons, the undercover cop yelled transphobic slurs at her as she was trying to get away. A group of cops violently tackled and arrested her. Rebecca was illegally held for over 48 hours while the police laughed at her and made comments about what they thought her anatomy looked like. These cases, along with so many other of horrific police abuse, are swept under the rug by city officials paying off lawsuits and courts dismissing cases. It's terrifying that this violence and abuse of power is both common knowledge and considered acceptable by the police and others in city government. With everything I shared with you today, you might be thinking, what's the answer? Well, the answer is to look at communities who have already created solutions for themselves because they could not rely on the police to keep them safe. Lorena Borjas was a friend, mentor and colleague, as well as so many other transgender women around the country who created systems of support, turned their homes into safe houses, and have developed techniques and tools to keep themselves and their community safe. When I asked some of my clients how they left trafficking, many of them told me, Lorena helped me escape. Lorena gave them a place to live, food to eat, and access to resources. Lorena's story is just one example of the many different communities coming together to provide support, food and safety for marginalized communities that have been abused by and forgotten by the police. In closing, I urge you to do three things. Look at the solutions already out there, fund the organizations that have the answer, and stop funding the police, specifically VICE. Thank you for your time today. Um, and also, Council Member uh, Rosenthal, it, I'm happy to answer your question about access to counseling because it's something I it's something I've had to work through for a number of years for my clients who are survivors of trafficking, if you'd like some more answers. Please uh, feel free to talk about it for a minute right now or feel free to reach out to my office. Uh, sure, I can try to be brief. I know my, my testimony was not as brief as it should have been, but I really cut it down. Um, it is very difficult to get people who've experienced uh, 
any type of violence into culturally competent um, services, to be very honest with you. Most of the time they're booked. I just had someone reach out to me recently asking if they knew of a place uh, that would provide counseling to a survivor of trafficking, working with the government. And I actually had to say, I have every place I know is full. And she had told me that all the places she knew were full. And then you add on to that language issues. You add into that someone being transgender. Cultural competency is so important. So it is so necessary to fund counseling and trauma-informed social work because there aren't a lot of spaces out there to provide these types of services. I'd love to follow up with you. If you could sure, reach out to my office, just go on to HelenRosenthal.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we'll go to Alyssa Crespo, followed by Melissa Brudeau. Uh, Alyssa, you may begin. Start in time. Hi, I was just asked to unmute, but I believe I'm after um, Elisa. Or should I, there we go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go, go ahead. Sorry for that mix up there, everyone. Go ahead. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, thank you, Chair Adams and members of the committee. My name is Elisa Crespo. I am the executive director of the New Pride Agenda. We're an LGBTQ advocacy organization. The topic of the hearing today is reducing the NYPD's responsibility and myself and others are here to reignite the call to dismantle and defund the NYPD vice squad. I would like to make it clear that this is not only a criminal justice issue, but this is a gender justice issue and a racial justice issue for our city. As many of you know, ProPublica recently combed through the arrest records of people in New York City who were charged with soliciting sex work and they discovered that 89% of people accused of sex working in the last four years were non-white as were 93% of those charged with trying to purchase sex. And so the vice squad is deliberately targeting black and brown sex workers, terrorizing them, then as is reported in the report, becoming embroiled in scandal by sexually harassing sex workers and coercing them into sexual favors. It is a sick abuse of power and I know all about it. I have personal experience with the vice squad who have pointed guns to my head as a result of me engaged in sex work. In the ProPublica report, one retired sergeant admitted, and I quote, the undercover can have a nice cold beer and watch a girl take her clothes off and he's getting paid for it. Former vice squad members themselves have also admitted to the ineffectiveness of this unit. They admit that the unit does not have any significant impact on reducing the rate of sex trafficking or sex work in this city, which are two different things, if I may add. Instead of funding this corrupt and reprehensible I'm unit inspired. that is claimed to be fighting against sex trafficking, which they are not, they are actively participating in sex trafficking. Instead, there are a number of critical social service programs that can be funded with the $18 million that the vice unit currently has, such as workforce development programs for sex workers, legal services for undocumented sex workers, and perhaps a universal basic income pilot program for sex workers, just to name a few. The mayor has announced his plan to help sex workers. It is a joke. If you wanna help sex workers dismantle vice and redistribute the funds directly to sex workers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Melissa, you may go next. Afterwards, we're gonna be followed by Evelyn Graham Nayasi. Um, and uh, Melissa, may go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you to the Public Safety Committee and Chairwoman Adams. Um, I hopefully will be very brief. I'm echoing so many of my colleagues' calls to dismantle the vice unit. 
I am legal director of Decriminalized Sex Work. I'm a longtime advocate for sex workers and survivors of trafficking uh, and a longtime attorney for these populations. Uh, alongside Lindley, I was at the Sex Workers Project uh, for many, many years, for about eight years as well, doing direct adv advocacy for sex workers and survivors. And I'm currently doing policy work. And I know that everybody you know, has shared such powerful stories. And I wanna point out that you know, really there's a very fundamental ideological problem with the vice unit, which is the conflation, of course, of human trafficking and of consensual sex work. And so we really have to figure out who are we trying to help? Who are we trying to prosecute? What are what goals are we trying to accomplish? Because most certainly everything that we've heard, everything I've seen in my legal career, we are not actually supporting or assisting anyone, right? We are really targeting, um, harming physically with the use of the criminal justice system, people of color, women of color, Asian women, um, are you know way overrepresented in arrests for prostitution and for unlicensed massage, right? Which, as we've heard, can lead to you know deportation, trauma, um, and death, right? As in the horrific story of uh, Yang Song that that Jared had mentioned. And so I think we really have to ask, what are our goals here? What are we trying to do? And and who are we trying to actually protect, right? Because it is clearly not working out right now. Asian women accounted for 50% of citywide arrests in 2019 um, and 65% of those arrested in 2019 in New York City and Queens. And as Elisa said, um, Black and Latino men are way over overrepresented in arrests for patronizing. So there is, you know, this is imbued with racism, gender discrimination, transphobia. So I also echo calling on the dismantling of vice and a reimagining of, of how we can really help support sex workers and survivors of human trafficking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Evelyn uh, Graham Nayasi, followed by Peggy Herrera and Mia Soto. Evelyn, you may begin. Starting to Thank you, Chairman Adams and the Committee on Public, uh, for Public Safety on inviting me the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Evelyn Graham and I am a peer. And I'd like to tell my story as to why we should have peers involved with the uh, current DHER process. I was sitting on my sofa quietly when someone knocked on my door and it was the police. A family member had called 911 and told the operator that I had a knife. Eight to nine police officers showed up and an officer told me that I had to go with him. No one asked me any questions or found the knife near me, but I had to go with him. I was afraid, so I put on my coat and shoes and grabbed my medication because they told me to bring it with me. I was escorted downstairs and when I got outside, an officer asked me if I wanted to go in the police car or ambulance. I chose the ambulance. Another police officer said he would ride with me. They dropped me off at Bellevue Hospital, which was the continuation of my nightmare. I waited three hours before a doctor saw me, and when I told him I needed my high blood pressure medication, he ignored and told me to go back to the waiting area. I could have had a stroke. Unfortunately for me, it was a three-day weekend, and I was stuck in a place where I did not belong. We were locked up like animals. People were screaming, yelling, and banging on windows. I was scared to death. I was also angry that a family member lied on me, angry that I was forced to go to the hospital, and angry when I learned I was stuck until Tuesday. When Tuesday finally came around, I was taken upstairs to the ward and wasn't released until two weeks later. I wish that the police officer had asked me questions and listened to my responses before telling me that I had to go with him because I wasn't acting violently. I also wish that there was some kind of support system, like a peer who may have gone through you know, a similar experience there to help me uh, get through and that I wouldn't have to go to the hospital at all. Um, as a result of my false hospitalization, it is a trigger now when I see a group of police officers because it reminds me of my bad experience and I no longer trust psychiatrists or that family member. I fear if we do not have peers 
that we will continue to have a problem with this with the situation as far as having a social worker instead of a peer to help uh, the, the person who is experiencing the mental health crisis. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next, we will go to Peggy Herrera, followed by Mia Soto. Peggy, you may go ahead. Hi. Um, well, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Peggy Herrera, and um, I am a steering committee member with CCIT NYC, and I am a mental health advocate. I am also a mother of a son who struggles with mental health issues. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity for, to testify today. Thank you, Cher Adams. It's always great to see you. Um, as I mentioned, I am a mother of a son who struggles with mental health issues. And on August 25th, 2019, I was arrested when I called for help for my son during a crisis. The police showed up first instead of medical professionals. Instead of getting help, I was arrested and my son never received the help he needed. It is ridiculous that a mother be criminalized for calling for help. That day I stood in the doorway to prevent police from coming into my home to interact with my son because I know how that, how's that has gone before for others. People with mental health issues are 18 times more likely to be killed during a police encounter. Police cannot help us because they are too busy criminalizing us. Police don't take the time to find out what happened before the crisis. Now in times when my son has a crisis and he needs to stay in his room where he feels safe, I go and sleep in my car. Where is the help for the family? We know that there are better ways to do this. The STAR program in Denver and the CAHOOTS program in Oregon seem to be working. But here in New York City, we still have people dying. Mental health is a medical issue, not a police issue. But it's not just a crisis response system that has failed my son. It is the entire mental health system or really lack of mental health system. As an advocate for my son, my biggest challenge has always been a lack of resources. And when I reflect on it, I realize that it has always been the barrier to my son getting what he needs. Years ago, my son deserved a school system that offered him services for behaviors that stem from trauma. As a young man whose trauma has been compounded from being criminalized so often, beginning with school safety at the age of 11, Time expired. He needs access to unlimited resources. My son should never worry about the amount of business because no one can determine when he will have a crisis. We need a mental health system that will address and treat individuals before their behaviors provoke a police response. We need a supportive and safe response. We need long-term mental health services that offer social services, coping skills, education, trades, jobs, supportive housing. When you give people what they need, you tell them that they matter. We cannot continue to rely on emergency rooms or jails as mental health centers. We need people with lived experience to respond. Uniforms are a trigger. We are facing a mental health crisis. Mental health is real. I demand that we get what we need for our families. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we will hear testimony from Mia Soto, followed by Nina Oshkajian. Mia, you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Hello. Adams and members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Mia Soto, and I'm the Community Organizer at Health Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today regarding the critical need to reduce the responsibility of New York City Police Department by completely eliminating the role of the police as responders in New York City system for responding to individuals who are experiencing a mental health crisis. New York must ensure that individuals who experience mental health crises receive appropriate services, which will de-escalate the crisis and ensure their well-being and the well-being of all other New Yorkers. Only those who are trained in de-escalation practices should respond to mental health crises. And the most appropriate individuals to respond to our peers and those with lived mental health experiences and healthcare providers. Police who are trained to uphold the law and order are not suited to deal with individuals experiencing mental health crises. To ascertain the scope of the issues surrounding law enforcement responses to people experiencing mental health crises, my organization, New York Lawyers for Public Interest, and our community partners developed and distributed an anonymous survey from September 2020 to June 2021. We anticipate releasing the report of our survey findings in the upcoming weeks, and we will be happy to discuss our findings and community data uh, in greater extent at your community. 
We analyzed survey data from 154 respondents who provided information about their own experiences and or recounted situations that they had ex witnessed. The data confirms and supports our demands for eliminating the police in the equation as respondents share alarming narratives of harmful and unacceptable experiences during a mental health crisis response. And according to our survey data, community members who sought help from 9-11, 911, instead of being offered compassionate, culturally competent care, indicated that they received inadequate care or experienced with traumatization, injuries, unnecessary and inappropriate involvement in the criminal system, forced hospitalizations, and elevated trust and mistrust, elevated fear and mistrust towards law enforcement. <sighs> New York City must prioritize a non-police, peer-led mental health crisis response system. My, our organization and, of course, with our in our coalition, uh, CCIT and OIC, a coalition of more than 80 community health advocacy and other organizations, make the following recommendation. Police need to be res removed as responders. Calls need to be rerouted to a number other than 9-11. Responses teams must include trained peers and emergency medical technicians. Response teams must be employed in dispatch of culturally competent community organizations. An advisory board of 51% or more peers from low-income communities of color must be implemented to provide oversight. Response plans should be comparable to other emergencies. We urge the New York City Council, especially the Committee on Public Safety, to immediately reduce the responsibilities of the NYPD by removing them as police responders to mental health crisis and move to institute a non-police response to mental health crisis with a long track of record of success. We must not stand by while the killings continue and now is the time for major transformation. Thank you. Mia, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we will go on uh, next to Nina Oshkajian, followed by Maria Danzillo. Nina, you may go once I'm muted. Good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Nina Lojkajian, and I'm a legal fellow at the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, a New York-based privacy and civil rights group. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today and specifically to speak about surveillance technology practices and policies. NYPD surveillance infrastructure must be dismantled. The first technology I'll discuss is body-worn cameras. These were meant to protect New Yorkers, but today they've become a threat. Predictably, officers abuse their indefensible discretion over when and what to record. Currently, Civilian Complaint Review Board investigators must submit records requests to receive footage, which must be approved by the NYPD legal borough. To fully protect New Yorkers, we would hope to eliminate body cams completely, but we realize that such a sweeping step may not be possible in the short term. As an intermediate step, at a minimum, body cam footage must be stored by an external custodian and not the department itself. The CCRB would be best positioned to play this role, safeguarding all footage and independently deciding what recordings should be released. Additionally, we support New York State Attorney General Letitia James's proposal to remove NYPD traffic enforcement powers. Traffic stops can be deadly for BIPOC New Yorkers. We need to ensure that the technologies that promote safer, less congested roads do not become yet another policing tool, particularly automated license plate readers or ALPRs. ALPRs can enforce congestion pricing, collect tolls, and even prevent speeding. But when the data they collect is unprotected, it also gives officers the ability to track nearly any car at any time for any reason. LPR data is kept for five years with no reported internal access controls. 70% of likely voters support ending NYPD traffic enforcement and transitioning to a non-police tra traffic safety service within the Department of Transportation. Not only could DOT more effectively and safely regulate traffic with infrastructural solutions, but removing LPR data from the NYPD's grasp protect privacy and safety. The department also cannot be trusted with access to data sources from other agencies through the Domain Awareness System, or DOS. DOS is a network of cameras, software, sensors, databases, and more that provides information and analytics to police officers, enabling persistent surveillance of everyday New Yorkers' activities. At a minimum, local agencies must terminate information sharing agreements with the NYPD. We hope this council takes steps towards the long-term goal of ditching the DOS and ending this Orwellian program completely. And finally, the council must reassert authority over NYPD procurement. 
every NYPD surveillance tool is either inherently biased or deployed discriminatorily. Many of these technologies have no place in New York City and should be categorically banned, as they should never have been purchased to begin with. The NYPD's bloated budget and surveillance expansion undermines community-based infrastructure. The council must reassert authority over NYPD procurement, deciding which tools and technologies are appropriate for our city. It's time to hold the department to the level of scrutiny their track record calls for. Above all, we must end their power to contract secretly, spending the, money's pu the public's money on tools that watch all of us, but which we can never see. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will have Maria Denzillo, followed by Tawaki Kamatsu. Maria, you may go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Adams, for your enlightened and inclusive opening statement, members of the committee and the public for all of your moving statements and perspectives and for the opportunity to speak. I'm here today to, today to testify as a lifelong resident of New York City, a mother of three who raised my children in New York City, and a recent candidate for the Democratic nomination for city council. The importance of public safety to people who live and work in New York City cannot be underestimated. Gotham shootings have more than doubled in the last two years to more than four people wounded and one killed per day. Safety is the central issue to people, whatever their living circumstances. It is the principal responsibility of government to provide this public safety. And when they fail at that, lives are at stake, trust in government is eroded, and we cannot achieve a fair and inclusive environment for all residents. Legitimate issues around police reform need to be addressed in a targeted way through hiring, training, oversight, and accountability, and not by unsafe and unproven removal of responsibilities. Otherwise, there will be a vacuum and public safety will be compromised to everyone's detriment. Our public safety officers, men and women who run toward the crisis, not away from it, should not be marginalized, demoralized, and compromised by failing to invest in their safety. We as a city will not be able to attract and retain the workforce that is needed to take the actions needed to make public safety a system that works for everyone. I grew up in Midwood, Brooklyn, where as a teenager in the 1970s, crime was a regular part of life and we just accepted it. Our house was robbed several times growing up and my dad, who owned a local pharmacy, was awakened regularly by the phone alarm system he had set up when a break-in occurred. Eventually, he closed shop after 60 years of a family business at the risk of running the business was just too high. The pharmacy, like so many small businesses, was a critical part of healthcare to a marginalized community. My closest friend was left without a father and breadwinner when she was 13, um, when he was shot dead in his jewelry store by two armed robbers who were never caught. This trauma lasted their whole lifetime. In 1982, after graduating law school, I moved to a small studio on the Upper West Side. My cousin, an Upper West Side social worker for decades, helped me work out a safety plan. A few years later, I was in a grocery store robbery where I watched helplessly as two thieves held a gun to the head of a terrified cashier. Several of my friends and colleagues had similar experiences. Nevertheless, I stayed committed to my neighborhood. The neighborhood did improve significantly during the 90s and aughts, and we have enjoyed a relatively safe and stable neighborhood. I raised my three children on the Upper West Side, and it has felt relatively safe until a few years ago. Our neighborhood has been on a downward spiral for years, and anyone who denies this reality is just engaging in gaslighting. Residents of NYCHA housing are elderly shopping on Broadway, teenagers going to school, even people sitting in outdoor restaurants have all experienced this loss of safety. I want to focus on two very personal events. However, there are countless New Yorkers who have their own personal stories of how crime impacted them, and we heard some of those earlier today. It's really important that we hear these stories. On December 11th, 2019, Tessa Majors, a Barnard freshman with her whole life ahead of her was stabbed to death in Morningside Park. May she rest in peace and may we never allow a murder like this to happen again. We can only assure this with adequate public safety as Tessa would not have been killed had there been a police presence in the park that evening. As a 40 year resident of the Upper West Side, everyone I knew, everyone knew, we all knew that Morningside Park is not safe and yet, was there any focus on this fact? Tessa's death and the death of every victim is on New York City. This was an unsafe park for years and years, and New York did nothing about it. My daughter was living literally half a block away when Tessa Majors was killed. It could have been her. It could have been any one of our kids, nieces, friends, neighbors. 
anyone who walked into the park that evening could have been a victim of that violent crime. There are thousands of Tessa majors all over the city, victims of gun and gang violence in NYCHA housing, small children, tourists, people at barbecues in their backyard, social clubs, sitting in restaurants, eating dinner. Where, elected leaders, is the action that is needed to help everyone keep safe in this city? Where is the outrage? Who is speaking for the victims today? On December 13, 2020, one year and two days after Tessa Majors was murdered, I almost went to a concert at St. John the Divine with the same daughter, but she was busy studying. This was a concert where a gunman opened fire on the steps of the church as people were entering the sanctuary. The police were nearby that day, perhaps because a number of public officials were present and they were able to stop the gunman from killing anyone else. These two terrifying incidents are very personal to me and that is why I bring them up today, but I don't wanna diminish the stories of thousands, countless other New Yorkers. Hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers have stories that are personal to them. The third perspective I bring to this discussion is as someone who ran for city council earlier this year. In my race for District 6, the most important issue to voters by far was public safety. And it was my focus on this issue and commitment to make sure we prioritize safety for all while prioritizing necessary police reforms propelled me to a second place finish after only a five month campaign fully funded by small in-district donations. The neighborhood made it clear they wanted a candidate who prioritized public safety and were tired of feeling their concerns were not being addressed. The Upper West Side has been besieged by a series of terrifying crimes in small businesses, in the parks, on the subway, and in the streets, as well as rampant quality of life issues, shoplifting, public indecency, open air, drug use, etc. These are all well documented, yet the response from elected was to deny the reality of a neighborhood spiraling downward and to call publicly for seriously abolishing the NYPD. Ms. Benzo, yeah. I need you to wrap up your comments, please. Of course you do. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, not one other what not one other speaker was asked to wrap up her comments. That's not true. It is the first. Okay. It is the first and foremost responsibility of government to provide public safety. All other obligations and duties mean nothing if government cannot keep every member of the community safe. We need to address police reforms and accountability so everyone feels safe. But we must have public safety. We must find solutions that will keep the streets safe and will keep repeat offenders off the streets. Without it, the city will not recover and cannot survive. The last thing people want to feel is that there is no one they can turn to when their safety is in jeopardy. And that is what will happen if there is not a careful and conscious approach that centers the safety of the residents of New York City. If our public safety officers are prevented from policing conduct and actions, how can we expect anyone to honor and obey the law? When NYPD does not, res when NYPD does not respond, the question is who will respond? Is it an effective and safe response? And has government taken, government taken the necessary steps to assure that it will work to keep people safe? I ask the committee to keep this in mind as your deliberations go forward and you move forward with your important work. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we will hear from Tawaki Komatsu. Um, if anyone else from the public wishes to speak, please uh, raise your hand on the Zoom and we could be sure to add you. Um, if not, Mr. Uh, Komatsu, you could go ahead, and after which we'll be returning to Chair Adams to close off. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Started time. This testimony is for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Um, this meeting itself was conducted in violation of New York State's Open Meetings Law. This committee um, established a two-minute time limit for testimony. The woman who just testified before me testified for roughly more than 10 minutes. So there's no compliance with um, applicable laws, applicable regulations. Also due to technical difficulties, uh, people that have been accessing this hearing have been, haven't been able to hear the entirety of the testimony in violation of, I think, open meetings law section 103. So open meetings law section 107 allows a court to void, void the hearing. Also with regards to the fact that this hearing is conducted remotely, there's no legal justification for that. Other hearings are being conducted in person. So again, this testimony, it's for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Uh, Ms. Adams violated New York City Charter 1116 by not complying with applicable laws and regulations. So uh, Section 1116 allows for a court to essentially fire her. Um, and I'm going to pursue that relief. Also, um, I was Ill illegally arrested at the Union Square subway station on August 19th. I submitted a FOIL request for the video from the uh, NYPD cameras. They're not complying with my legal rights to get that video prior to the case. 
Um, I talked to an MTA worker who confirmed I swiped my Metro card through the reader. So basically that was a false arrest. They claimed that I didn't use my Metro card when the MTA worker uh, confirmed that I did. Also the NYPD workers in the Union Square station, they didn't let me make a phone call while I was in handcuffs. So that violated my rights as well. So Ms. Adams, you're the chairwoman of this committee. You don't do jack. I've testified to you previously. You're totally useless. So this testimony is for the public. I'm looking to have the public essentially fire all members of the city council who currently are members of the city council in accordance with their constitutional rights. Um, and with regards to the public, if they want to join my federal lawsuit, the case is Komatsu versus City of New York, case number 20-CV7046. It's assigned to federal judge Edgardo Ramos sorry. as well. Uh, can I continue since the woman before me just testified for more than 10 minutes? So again, um, there's something called the 14th Amendment, equal, prote equal protection rights, um, prohibitions against discrimination, selective enforcement, abusive process. So you're having double standards throughout your whole hearing. You're having some people who are allowed to testify about irrelevant matters. Mr. Perez, Sergeant Perez of the New York City Council, he previously illegally prevented me from attending a public hearing. I think it was on November 19th after Richie Torres illegally kicked me out of a public hearing when I simply told him um, that I felt that he lied to my face, which in fact he did. Also, the city council has restrictions about um, presenting pre-recorded video testimony during public hearings. However, there's been no due process with the public about exactly why that is, like what the rationale is for not allowing members of the public to show people like you, Ms. Adams, if they're being punched in the face by a member of the NYPD. How in the heck can people like me, you know, show that to you during a public hearing if we're not allowed to present pre-recorded video uh, you know, testimony from like a NYPD body camera. I mean, what's the rationale for that? I mean, you're having this public hearing, you're sp supposedly the chairwoman of this committee. So can we get a straight answer from someone like you? I mean, is that too much to ask? Anyway, that's the conclusion of this testimony. And again, um, I'm going to ask the second circuit today through a legal filing to avoid today's hearing because people like me at the end of the day, we can't rely on you. We can't rely on people in the press because the fact of the matter is there is no press in New York City. They're just a bunch of censors, censors just like the New York City Council. That's it. Second Circuit, this is Tawaka Komatsu. This is the end of my testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Chair Adams, uh, passing it off to you uh, to finish things off. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. If there is no further testimony from the public, I'd like to thank all of the panels that testified today um, for members of the NYPD, our advocates, and certainly our public. Thank you to my colleagues for this hearing today, very important hearing. Thank you especially to my colleagues that, uh, that stuck it out uh, to, for this entire hearing today. If all work has been done, this hearing is hereby adjourned. Thank you, Chair Adams, and that concludes this hearing. Thank you.